So if you got a left tear, you move your cams left. If you got a right tear, you move your cams right. Just try it and see what happens. That's what's the fun about it. That's what's good about bows is tinkering. Tinkering. Yeah, it's fun. You know what I mean? It doesn't cost anything to really tinker. I mean, yeah, if you buy accessories. I mean, you got to buy all the shit. Cost your time. Yeah, yeah, my wife time. and kids. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I tinker, every time I press that trigger, it costs me a lot of money. Press. That's, that's why archery is better than rifle, honey. Yeah. It's just, you, can shoot, you can shoot how many it's arrows? recyclable. Recyclable, yeah. I like, yeah. I like that part that's of it. That's it. Whereas your rifle shooter, you're into it. Mm-hmm. How much do you figure you're into it one round? Frick. I mean... Got to be at least a couple bucks. Got to be. Yeah. Right? A couple Gotta bucks be like a shot. Five bucks. Yeah, you think of, uh, I'll, I'll do some math here. I'll do some what math do you think the cheap like end bucks. would be? Like two bucks? I mean, even if it's two bucks, that's two yeah, bucks a see. round. I know. Dude, whereas, how, can you, how can you afford to shoot a rifle? <laughs> <laughs> whereas with archery, like what you're going to be all in and done, you're going to be 300 for a dozen arrows. 350 for real uh, for the elite. Yeah, the elite of the elite. Yeah, if you're going you're out, it, yeah. But so, you got you you figure you're gonna get hundreds and hundreds of shots out of those. At so least here's yeah. a quick quick math to get all right. So powder, you know, is like three hundred and fifty bucks for five was it yeah, five pound jugs? Eight, eight pound jugs right now, three hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, each what'd you pay for your I'm kind of I shipping everything was four twenty five. Yeah, for eight pounds of H one thousand. Hold on, I need to relay this because I can't hear you. Four hundred and twenty-five dollars with hazmat and shipping. With hazmat and shipping for how much? Eight pounds. For eight pounds. I get about ninety rounds. <laughs> so you get ninety rounds per pound, and you bought eight pounds for four hundred twenty-five bucks. Plus my. That's just powder. That doesn't include the bullet or nothing. The, or nothing. The Primers are outrageous, yeah. So that's the thing. Like, you got primers and you got powder and you got bullets. And cases. You can you can reload those. Like, I'm up to like seven seven firings on some of them, but they're getting kind of seven iffy. seven firings per case. Per, yeah, per case. Yeah. But like my, my bullets right there, I just calculated my prices. It's one dollar per shot on, a, on just on the bullet, just on the projectile. That's honestly cheaper than I thought. On yeah, the, and they got powder wait, on the bullet. Just, just, on just the, bullet. the bullet itself. Just the oh, bullet. Just itself. the bullet oh, itself. Okay. So nine, primary nine another primer and nine cleaning powder. What do, you, what do you think you're into at one round? Got to be five bucks. Five it's it's got to be probably five bucks, yeah. Per round. Maybe. It's a $100 a day every time you go to the range. How much do you think you spend in rounds in a year? <laughs> <laughs> like how much do you shoot? I, I, I want to know. know. I, don't I do want to know. Because I'm just know. trying to gauge this. But like, here's the thing too, though. Like we're, talking about, we're talking about equipment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the equipment side is expensive. That's where I think it's actually more. Like everyone always gets into it because they think it's cheaper like to reload or do this. But it's not. You just start diving down rabbit holes. It's Adam. It's not cheaper. You don't think to reload? No, your own? because because it, it would be if you just did it basic. But once you start getting into it, like you want an annealer, you want, you know, all a Henderson trimmer. Like I, I just literally bought a Henderson precision trimmer to like trim my brass. Made, like made in Henderson, Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, just, <laughs> just like make every year, I try to buy something new to like make my process more refined. Make try to see if I can get accuracy gains. And like we're talking about archery, that's the same thing I did back in the day. You'd, you'd start with what? Like an arrow saw. Yeah. And then you maybe get a bow press later. And then maybe Squaring you start device. doing... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you start just adding these things where it's like, really, is it really cheaper? Because now look at like $3,000 worth of equipment you, you got sitting there, plus all the time, plus all the components, plus everything else. Yeah, but I can do it in perpetuity, which is why you do it too, I'm yeah, sure. Exactly. For, for yeah, exactly. For future stuff. And it can use for any bow you get. You can use the same tuning stuff. Sure. Same. I can switch rifles. Yeah, I have to buy different, slightly different components, but a lot of those stuff I can re redo across. I want to know how cartridge. much you spend in a year in rounds. It's got to be. I'll, I'll, I'll do some calculations. <laughs> Is it lot. five grand? It could be. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how a lot to do lot? You shoot? Yeah, you shoot once a week at yeah, least. Yeah, shoot once a week. And how, ma- how many rounds do, when you go to practice? Sometimes I only go and maybe shoot five. Five maybe, rounds. Maybe I'll shoot 10, 15 if I'm doing a lot of long range stuff. That's, but that's like, a $25 morning. Five rounds. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't, I don't go and shoot a ton when I go out because I'm, I'm there for a purpose. Like I'm there just to do long range testing, or I'm there to do hundred yard zero testing, or I'm there to do extreme spread testing, or I'm there, to, you know. To how do you get, how do you get practice though? Like how do you how do you? I mean, do you feel like you? 
Do you feel like you're getting enough rounds downrange to yeah. fill? But that's the thing too, though. I will like I shoot big thirty cals, and so I don't want to burn out barrels because you know I can always get new barrels. But like, I'm thinking about getting a training rifle this year, like a twenty two and like twenty two long rifle, and just like literally soup it up as a training rifle. If I can get twenty two long rifle and be able to shoot hundred hundred yards, start manipulating, you know, shooting in wind, seeing all that affects it. Yeah, it's not going to be the same as shooting a thirty. No, cal. but it's it's, but practice. it's, 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 it's repetition. Just practice. Yeah. Repetition, pressing the trigger, having my yeah. hand on it correctly, breathing correctly. You know, getting in a gun really quickly and shooting. It's like I want to get a practice gun. Mm -hmm. Just because as I don't far want... as you don't have a practice gun, I know, I sure. agree. That's that's kind of why I got the six eight western as like a practice one, and I got all my lo reloading components. I got powder for it. I got a bunch of primers. I got everything I need. I got brass and I got projectiles, but I just haven't started reloading for the six eight. Yeah, but that was going to be my practice one. Gotcha. But I think a twenty two would be kind of fun. Super up a twenty two. Yeah, that would be fun. Just go plank in. Go plank with in. a suppressor. What? Right, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> Suppressor. I have a 22 suppressor for my son. Suppressor, yep. Yep. That's exactly what I You, you guys son. would be surprised over the weekend because I was, you know, hunting with my family. I got back and I got tagged. Giannis from Meat Eater, he did a post about talking about his new gun. And so many people commented like, Brady should re look at this because he was bragging up on his suppressor. Yeah. So many people and called me out. And he had the suppressor out. cover too. <laughs> yeah. Suppressor uh, cover. Called you out for not having a suppressor. He's like, surprise, Brady around. doesn't use a suppressor. Brady should listen to Giannis and start shooting, hunt with a suppressor. Brady should listen to Giannis. Yeah, Giannis <laughs> Come on, Brady. <laughs> Get with the program, Brady. I know, right? So you got one on order? No. You're not even going to like sc scratch the itch just to tinker with it, just to be like, oh, I wonder. No? You were out hunting when we had the conversation about suppressor I listened. and no suppressor. Did you, you listen to it? Yeah, okay, I listened good. in, yeah. yeah. I, gave her a, I gave her a list on the way home. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we're all back. We've been we've been out. We've Everybody's been, out, been yeah. out. Did you guys have a good Thanksgiving? I did. Just yeah. Stick around. You went to. I was hunting. You, had <laughs> you almost did it again, Trail. <laughs> I know I did. You had the best Thanksgiving. Yeah. You were hunting on Thanksgiving Day. Yep. So here's the thing in my life, like yeah, way back in the day, we obviously did some family Thanksgiving, but for the most part, my dad was gone a lot on Thanksgiving because he was always hunting Western states. Like he was just his white tail thing. Or, did your mom hate that growing up? I don't know. We like. We always celebrate it at different times, kind of like it wasn't actually on Thanksgiving, <laughs> but like, and so now I've set this precedence in my life where I had, I literally can't remember the last time I was actually home and had a real Thanksgiving because I've always been hunting on Thanksgiving. Like every time I've been to go hunt 10 years, like I've never been here for Thanksgiving no, in 10 years. That's true. Even before that, like it was a trend too. It's like, I just don't want to, now it's set in my life where I'm just gone Thanksgiving. I'll find a way to go on a hunt, like did, duck hunting, whatever it needs to be. I'll, I'll go hunting. Did you go home and then have the big Thanksgiving? Do you guys normally do that? No, uh, this time we didn't, no. But I, I did go <laughs> home to see my brother's new little baby. No turkey, no before. stuffing? Nope, didn't have any of it. No cranberry sauce? Nope. We had, wow. we had mule deer jerky. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of mule deer jerky. Yeah, we hunted on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Good hunt. Good hunt. Yeah, we didn't we didn't kill on Thanksgiving. Usually we kill one buck on Thanksgiving, but my brother killed his buck the day before and I killed mine the day before that. So my my youngest brother got his first ever mule deer. Super pumped on that. Got a solid buck. We had to stop through a uh, a check station. Talked to a bunch of game wardens. Like I was just BSing about like deer numbers and what, what do they think mm -hmm. deer numbers are about? And they said drought, you know, C W D. What they, they, they did say some management stuff. They did throw that out there. Mm. And and uh, then we got to talk and they're like, hey, we need, we need to check at the rack because they're looking at the tags, looking at the meat. So we took him into the trailer, showed him my brother's buck. He's like, that is the biggest deer we've probably seen in like for that, this dude running the check station for the last three weeks. It's the biggest deer they've seen come through there. Hmm. Damn. Because yeah. he's like, most people are bringing in four corns and three points. That's just that, 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 that's what it is now in some of these states. Mule deer Jesus. They feel like uh, numbers are down generally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, numbers are down. And then so the guys are seeing a lot, but he's like, we're seeing we have more elk getting brought through these check stations than we are deer, hmm. mule deer. Well, that's and not I good. was like, what's the outlook? And he's like, I don't know. We just need. He's like, I think we're missing an age class. Like, I think we're really missing an age class, or maybe two age classes mm -hmm. because of the drought and then winter kill and just yeah. you know, CWD is more prevalent. I don't. I, Those are rough years. You get yeah. you get you get a hard winter and then you get drought or drought and then a hard winter. You get those like yeah. con you compounding. Know, compounding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely wipe out. You're just knocking them down. I feel so bad for deer. Like I saw when we're out there, they're like, gosh, there's just not a lot of deer numbers. It's it's fun, like hunting hard to find a big deer, and then it feels kind of cool when you do kill it, but then also I feel bad at the same time. Like we just <laughs> killed like we killed the two biggest deer we saw yeah. the entire time. Like, I don't know, it sits with me really. There'll be more. Oh, there'll always be more, yeah. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, you always hope. 
Did you stay at home for Thanksgiving? I did, yeah. Which we, my family usually travels. I'm the exact opposite of Brady. You guys know, normally go north, right? Well, yeah, we usually go to the ranch or something like yeah. that. But like, I can't remember a Thanksgiving that I wasn't just stuck not hunting. Yeah, I know? think you remember saying <laughs> something like, like that. Like the exact opposite the of Brady. Um, you know, so there's pros and cons to both. I'm obviously jealous of not hunting over Thanksgiving like Brady, but good family time. But we stayed here this year just because of the new, the new, yeah, baby. new babe. Yeah. So new babe's good. New babe's good, man. Growing. It's growing. Eating like crazy. <laughs> That's all he does. That's literally all he does. He's a good baby. Super easy, cons- easily consolable. Not like, not a bad baby by any means. Just eats constantly. <laughs> like not nonstop. It's crazy. Do you just go home from work and hold him? Yeah. To sit down? That's yeah. the best. But then I get yelled at by my four-year-old. Oh, really? Dad, Play with me. Dad, Hot Wheels. I'm like, <laughs> trying to help your mom, buddy. Hold on. Yeah. Has he had mm. any kind of adjustment? He's done really good, honestly. He's done amazing. His only adjustment is like not getting what he wants at all times mm-hmm. from from me. Yeah. So like the whole come home, play Hot Wheels, play all this stuff. It's like, you know, I need to help your mom for an hour and then I'll go. A little more competition yeah, for exactly. attention. But he's he like hasn't been a shithead about it no, at all. No temper. No, tantrum. none. Huh. Like he just Yeah, he's he's been really good. That's good. What about you? Yeah, just I went to my sister's uh, place. She lives in kind of centrally. So my brother lives in Ogden. I got a brother in Wyoming, and then my mom and dad live in Logan, and then we're in southern Utah. So we went up, all got together, and just did dinner. And so we just did up and back. But yeah, I got back from uh, from my Nevada deer hunt. I think the day before, day before I think. So we pretty much just turned and burned. Yeah, yeah. I got home about two thirty, maybe two thirty in the morning, and. Just threw the, threw the buck and the meat, hung it up from the back porch because it's been freezing in cedar. I mean, it's been, you know, 20 degrees and less at night. So, yeah, just hung that from the back porch, and then we just jumped in the car and then went north and did Thanksgiving up there. It was good. Yeah, just up and back. Lots of lots of windshield time the last few weeks. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I was bet. back and forth to <clears throat> Salt Lake. So that hunt I was on was like northern Nevada. So I drove home, got home. Next day, Thanksgiving, did Thanksgiving up and back. And then uh, I was home the next day. But the day after that, my kid had a game in Salt Lake. So got off work, drove to Salt Lake, went to that game, watched it, then drove back. So it was like Jeepers. three times back and forth between Salt Lake and like three a lot days. of miles. It's not so many miles. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's a lot of miles. Yeah, I've, I was there was a stretch there. I was like, man, I think I've listened to every podcast available to <laughs> me at this point. That's just the entire library of podcasts. I'd listened to it also. I can't wait to hear about your buck. Man, and you're hunting. Do you want to hear about it real quick? <laughs> Should we do like proper <laughs> proper recaps? recaps? We can. I think we need to do proper recaps. We've been asked a lot about like. I can proper give you recaps. the cliff notes if you want. Quick cliff notes. Quick, yeah. So, uh, like 700 plus miles on the truck, roads and trails everywhere. So every ridge has got a road. Every drainage, it's got a road in it. Just drove and just completely glassed my ass off. Found a buck that I wanted to hunt. Um, screwed that up and we can talk about that and go deeper out on that and then looked at a lot of bucks i mean tons and tons of deer rutting mule deer rut was definitely on like i was seeing two you know two three points just full on i have some i have some footage of like you know that like epic yeah yeah like fight to the death there was one one fight i was watching i was like dude i think one of these is legit gonna kill the other one like Hmm. i mean getting after it which is fun to watch but just you know small bucks yeah yeah and then last day um you know, driving back to camp, <laughs> I had looked out my passenger side window, two does come up out of a wash, look up on the hill, see a group of seven deer. One of them's a nice buck, which I'd seen two days prior, maybe a mile and a half north of there. Uh, just grabbed my bone, jumped out of the truck and left the truck running in the road, <laughs> dove off into the wash. And I was able to cut maybe 30, 40 yards just using the wash. It was over my head, one of those big, deep washes and just popped up and I mean, he's like 65 yards, so I was able to get like another five yards and just laced him. Nice. Gosh, you're my hero. Yeah, I tipped over dead. Well, yeah, I mean, we got some pictures with a, a new pack. You know, I wanted to throw some quarters on it just for kicks, but that buck literally died. I think I ranged my truck, which was running in the road, <laughs> 58 yards. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, Hell of a pack out. <laughs> so I don't know. I know it wasn't the epic like... Uh, you know, I guess there's all types of hunts, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's an elk hunt like I went on this year where I was nine miles, you know, and I was three days to pack that bull out. And there's hunts like this that are sometimes you just get a bird in a hand. Yeah. Just a gimme. And Do you think more of the late season hunts are for sure. that style? For because sure. there's, there's always roads where these bucks are, yeah, you know, for sure. Range. Yeah. And that's, it's not my favorite type of hunt. I mean, I don't, I don't know. We filmed it, so we'll see what comes out of it, but there's probably many times on that hunt where 
you know, I'm looking at a camera and going, man, this is just not my favorite type of hunt. Just where you're just covering country in a truck and you're really looking for a buck. And then once you find that buck, you're hunting him, you know? Mm-hmm. And that part, I, I don't like the driving and glassing. It's just not really my jam. It's actually, in my opinion, it's, I, it's harder for me. It's like mm-hmm. more of a mental grind. I mean, we went from dark to dark every single day, just covering <laughs> so many bumpy, rough miles. Like, guaranteed, my truck is going to need some work. <laughs> Definitely new running boards. Tired on the company p- seaters. Here we <laughs> yeah. come. Definitely new running boards on the passenger side. Yeah. Those took a hit, but uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't wasn't my favorite type of hunt, but in the end, it worked out, and it was it was fun. I mean, it was a fun chance to look at a ton of deer. Yeah. It's fun. I mean, it's, it's always fun to hunt deer in the rut, right? Uh huh. I didn't see any. Yeah, that's I, for sure. Yeah, I didn't see tons of big bucks like I had hoped. A lot of uh, yearling bucks and two year old bucks, and it's kind of the same. It did. It really does feel like there was kind of that age class of like that four year old, five year old bucks, which missing. is kind of missing. I think I maybe saw, and this is legit the truth. I probably saw 150 bucks. I think I might have saw one four year old buck. Yeah, yeah. and that was rough. body size. Wasn't antlers, you know, yeah. showing out like that was body size, four year old, four and a half year old buck. So tough in that That's regard. That's rough. It's like, it's like that across the whole West, man. It's just, I mean, there's pockets. Yeah, there is pockets. I think there's, there's some pockets. There. Yeah, I think you know, Southern Utah saw a lot of really good deer this year. Um, you know, they've killed some great bucks out of Arizona. Mm-hmm. I've seen some decent bucks out of New Mexico. Did you guys see the governor's buck out of Colorado? Yeah, I did. To what, 70? 270. 272. Uh, I mean, that's a giant. Yeah. And just a cool configuration on that buck. So Wild. You probably know more about that one than I do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm just reading your face. I know everything. <laughs> I don't Not know. Not to sound like an asshole. But I don't like, know anything about it. I was than through, just through it. text message. I was like in the mix during. You were following along? Oh, I was, okay. I was like watching play by the movie. Play? Yeah. It was a giant deer. Giant deer. I mean... Probably one of the coolest bucks I've seen in a long time. Pretty good fluke, too, honestly. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Kind of a no-namer unit, maybe? Oh, yeah, no-namer unit. Like, just a pretty good, like, one of those things where you chase rumors for a long time, and Mm -hmm. you're like, ah, this shit ain't real. And then hunting sucks, hunting sucks, hunting sucks. Ah, let's go check on that rumor one more time. Bang. There he is. So wild. That's a cool story. Yeah. Ghost buck. That's wild. Ghost. Well, today I thought we would do a bow review. Oh, I got a even better thing for you on that buck. Yeah, I don't. I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to put this out there, but no, no names here. But Jay Scott's friend, they killed that buck on public land, mm-hmm. BLM public land. Jay Scott's friend missed that buck at 125 yards, third season. Oof. Yeah. With the yeah. 125 <laughs> yards in that same BLM. Ouch. Buck fever. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It's just. That was something that came after Factory that, loads. after that deer <laughs> was loads, dead and the press settled. There was a, there was a hey. No, no, no one else heard yeah. that. <laughs> Sur- what did he say? <laughs> I said suppressor. <laughs> there was oh, a no. there was a text message sent, and it was forwarded to me. Hey, yeah, that buck is third season missed it 125. I'm like, oh my god. You ever missed an animal like that that you not just like that. haunted you like that? Well, I haven't. I don't think. No, not not like that. I missed one when I was young, when I was 16 years old. Big pomaded thing, Southern Utah rifle tag. One of my first like really good tags, and I missed him. Missed him a bunch, a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> I was 16. 16. Yeah, and I can... still that one still I still remember the shots, what happened, the feeling out. I, I I still remember all of it. You probably live with that one a little bit easier knowing you were. Oh six, yeah, 16. I mean, it's such an easy write off. I was 16. I've yeah. only killed what three deer before. Sure. That. Yeah, I don't think I have. That one would haunt you, though. Yeah. A buck of that caliber. Mm-hmm. Especially on BLM. Yikes. Public, like when you guys know Colorado just like I do, mm. to see that buck, that yeah. buck. on public, uh-huh. like you, uh, we could all go to 15 different private ranches and see, you know, not a buck like that, but like mm-hmm. very, very yeah, good deer. deer. But to see that buck on public, holy That's shit. That's like truly a definition of once, <sighs> on many, once in many lifetimes. Yep. I've never seen a buck that big on the hoof. Uh, Have you? No, 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 not 270. Two, no. 215, 220 is probably the biggest deer I've ever seen on the hoof. 259 is think. the biggest I've seen on the hoof. 259? Yikes. Two, Dude, they just look stupid. 259 is deer. the biggest I've seen on the hoof. That's crazy. What's the biggest bull you've ever seen on the hoof? 424. Gotcha. How big is that? Oh, it's so big. That's mind blowing. That was last year. Just on the hoof? Yeah, last year, 424. Before that, it was 407. Go. And I, I luckily 
these like I've these bulls got killed. Mm-hmm. So I, I know what I you know right. You know it's saw. always nice because when you see something that big, like the whole time I was looking at that bull last year, that four twenty four bull, and I'm not good at scoring out. They're just so they get to a point where they're just so yeah. big mm-hmm. for that me. It's just, I don't know, like big. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. It's just gigantic, bigger than anything I've ever seen. And then to keep sitting there looking at him like, man, that bull has to be 400. And then you add him up again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's no way he's not. There's no way. And But you still, it's so hard to say. Mm-hmm. And then he ended up getting killed in his 424. That's so stupid big. Mm-hmm. And then the one before that was a Nevada bull. This was a long time ago. Straight 6.407. Um, and Greg Crow's bow hunter killed it. So I, we saw him two days before. He Is got that killed. Extras or straight six? No, straight six. Straight six. Uncover a hunt and fool. Long time ago. Long time straight ago. Straight six. Greg Crow's hunter, 407. Jack Brittingham killed it. Gosh, damn. That's big. I'm pretty sure it was. Sorry if I misspoke there. I'm pretty sure it was Jack Brittingham who killed it with hmm. Greg. What's the biggest bull you think you've seen, Jarrell? Oh, uh, that, that bull that my brother picked the, head, the sheds off of, I think they figured it was 430. So I remember, I remember seeing it on winter range. Um, probably the biggest bull that I ever remember seeing with the tag in our pockets was my dad had a late season tag in 07. And second day I saw a bull had a missing second. So I had a busted second on the right side. And that bull was over 400 with a missing second for sure. Wow. That was the biggest bull. I think I, so he was probably what, 420, I would say four four fifteen ish. But I remember seeing that bull and just thinking like, that's the biggest animal I've ever seen like yeah. you know with a tag we, we didn't kill that bull we hunted it for what six seven more days and could never turn it back up but i mean i've seen i'm trying to think like yeah that bull that my brother picked up the sheds i mean that was a giant um you know we'd seen it the year before it was bu- always busted the busted main beams you know but i can't think of too many bulls i've seen like 360 370 bulls you know my brother killed a bull that was 378 and i remember looking watching i watched him shoot that through the spotting scope so i remember you know what that looked like but i mean you go from you know 380 to 410 such I a mean, big jump i yeah. mean it's they just look big. C- cartoonish yeah, they at look that fake. point yeah and, and mule deer i think even more so mm-hmm. yeah that's cool. It's fun. To, that's what's fun, though. I mean, it's fun to know. I mean, they're still out there. I mean, this guy just killed this governor's yeah. tech buck. I mean, that buck was on, you know, BLM and kind of a no name or unit, I think, a little bit. Maybe. I don't know. I'm yes. just, just what I've heard. But And then yes. that buck that Brett, uh, what was his name? The guy that we did the little documentary on a few years ago. Brett three, Ross. Brett Ross. Yeah. 300 inch buck. I mean, that buck. Public land. Public land. <laughs> just, yeah. That's what's great about it, is yeah. there's still some just absolute. The Kyle Lopez buck, 316 yeah, in Colorado. They, he's public land. Just misnomers, just out there floating around, getting yeah. by. Gives me hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about bows though today. Let's talk about bows. Let's do a promo first though. Sure, you want to keep talking about big bucks? <laughs> I do like Reliving talking about the big glory bucks. Days. Yeah. Um, I got told by marketing we have to hit the promo in the first part of the podcast. So we got to hit the promo. We're twenty three minutes in. We're so. way we're way. <laughs> 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 Sorry guys. Oops. I think they they said first five minutes would be preferable, but we're, first twenty five minutes. We, we, okay. we missed the mark. Let's go. Yeah. Do you want to hit promo? Or do you want me to hit, hit promo? I've been gone. I don't even know what, what you I, don't even know what it is. I don't, it, I don't either right now. But uh, we'll, we'll just say podcast. Yeah, promo, promo, promo podcast. podcast. Um, just use it when you sign up. Uh, it's been good for fifty points back in the Go Hunt Gear Shop. Yeah. Uh, we're moving definitely into research season. And uh, also maps. I mean, people are still using maps. I use maps all the time. I use it in conjunction with my research. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use it a ton in Nevada. So when I, I, drew, I drew this tag, uh, I applied for it based on using draw odds and you know application strategy articles and how Nevada draw system works. Uh, I drew my first choice and, you know, I was using maps the whole time in relation to my application just to kind of see what the topography and, and uh, what the layout of the land might be like. So, yeah, use the promo code podcast. Sign up for an insider account or a maps membership. Yep, get you 50 bucks back to the Go Hunt Gear Shop. That's it. So with that, we're, we want to talk bows and it's kind of probably a weird time of year. I always thought it was kind of a weird time of year. It seems like everybody releases in late October, early November. Weird. That's what we talked about last yeah, podcast. Yeah, with, with the suppressor it's podcast. so weird. I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it does always seem odd to me that they release in November, but yeah. that's typically when October, November time frame is when bows are released. Uh, but they and then they all release at the same time. <clears throat> all it's companies, like you, kind if of. you guys yeah, just released about a month, in like a August, month, a month you'd window. be the only bow being talked about. <laughs> you'd be the only one. 
you have all these free months. It's got to be something to do with production, right? Yeah. Getting, getting production probably. runs out so that you have a chance to shoot them and get geared up for mm-hmm. the next year, next fall. But there's, I mean, literally, as we speak, there's probably still people in tree stands, right, hunting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, mm-hmm. to think that you're just going to drop your existing setup, go <laughs> get a go new bow, yeah. get it all tuned up and dialed and sight tapes and to mm-hmm. then hunt. I mean, what? They got a couple weeks yeah, left. Yeah, a couple of, weeks probably. They're not going to drop their existing setup. <laughs> yeah. And it's a hard time to shoot a bow, too. Like, if you're going to be tree stand hunting, it's going to be brutally cold. Oh, so you yeah. want to use something that you've been shooting constantly. Mm-hmm. You had your bow quite a ways before November. I had mine for 10 days before I took it to Colorado. But way before November. Yeah, I had it way before November. I had it, yeah. uh, I want to say, I left for that elk hunt like the 12th, 12th or 14th of uh September. I think I got it like the first week of September, which would be somewhat of a a testament to how comfortable the bow felt that I felt good enough within 10 days to set that bow up, sight my pins in, and I felt confident enough to take it in the field and go on. We should say it was the Matthews lift. Matthews lift. Yeah. 33. Yep. 33. Yep. So I thought, I thought for this podcast, we do somewhat of a bow review. You've got yours. Yep. You've had it for a month, I would say. Uh, Half a month. Half a month. Three weeks, maybe? Yeah, three weeks. Yeah. Uh, It launched it on the 14th, so I thought we would do kind of a bow review. And then also, I thought it would be interesting just to talk through bow selection. Mm -hmm. So I I know that's a question I get asked a ton. I've actually been asked. I've probably had, when I got back into service from Nevada, I probably had 30 DMs (laughs) of like, hey, do you really like that bow? What do you like about it? You know. Uh, So just like what, what to look for when you're buying a new bow. Um, Brady's probably been a minute since you got a new bow. Yeah, Matthew's Atlas. Atlas. Yeah. I will tell you though, Brady is a wealth of knowledge still. Which yeah. why wouldn't he be? Because he knows all this shit and he's data driven. But like mm-hmm. messing with this bow, he still got all these little nuggets. Oh, he's still telling you little things. Yeah, like, tips and tricks. Hey, did you do this? I'm like, where you been, Brady? Mm-hmm. Like, come talk yeah. to me, man. What else should we do? Yeah, he knows all the tricks still. Gotcha. So I thought before we dove into like an outright review, I thought it'd be good to just talk about what people are looking for. What do you, what you should look for? Kind of what are the most uh, interesting or like the most critical factors, I guess, in buying a new bow, like what you look for. I know that Lorenzo, Mm -hmm. I was particularly interested in talking to you because you've been super slow to adopt a new bow. Yep. Uh, You've been shooting the Halon X since I think that came out in like 2016. 2016. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you're, man. (laughs) Damn, time flies. Yeah. It's crazy. It kind That's of like, seemed a long yeah, time ago. It's but like eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. Judas Priest. Where I've did, been shooting that bow since. Where did time go? And I got that bow early in 2016. Yeah. That year, remember? Mm-hmm. So I hunted with it in 2016. Gotcha. That's so wild. That's you just think long, of the technology from then to now. Yeah, eight years. It's pretty wild. It is. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you decided to make the switch. I did. This year. Why? Thanks to you. <laughs> Why? Like, what are you looking for in a bow? Like, let's say you go, you walk into a bow shop. I mean, we we didn't. Well, I didn't walk into a bow shop. I got my bow. I'm gonna just be outright. And we, and we have a good partnership with Matthews. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna talk about Matthews. I don't have any issues with talking about other bows, and I'm fairly up to snuff on other. There's bows. one bow I want to talk about outside of Matthews, but yeah. okay, yeah, we can and we can, well, we can do that. But I mean, for those of you that are listening, we're probably gonna talk mostly Matthews. Yeah. Um, I, I can answer questions about other bows. I get a chance to tinker with others, and sometimes I like to pop up to my lo- local pro shop and shoot other bows. I know that when uh, Hoyt launched their RX, it just yeah. day the eight came out. I popped up there opening day just to pull one out of the box and look at it, see what it looked like. But so I still have a ton of interest. I've shot other bows. I've shot uh, Elite. I've owned Elites. I've owned Hoyts. I've owned Matthews. Uh, my brother owns a Bowtech. I tinker around with that, so I've got some ideas. But if you have questions, you can ask. But Mostly, yeah. mostly Matthews. Um, so with that, what, what do you look for? What do you look for in a bow? Like this year you got a new yeah. bow. Well, yep. let's run through factors. What are you looking yeah. for in a bow? Well, I'll start, I'll start with this. Anyone who knows me good or knows me well here, which you guys do. Like I, I get consumed by things. So I rarely like pick up something new because once I do, like I'll just, I go so deep into it. And a lot of the times I don't have like the mental space or capacity to like just jump into something new. Like it was photography there photography for a while before it was, it's been a lot of things over the years. Sorry. Um, and then, you know, with business and family and all this stuff, like it's, I try to like corral myself. Cause I know once I dive in, I'm, I'm diving in and <laughs> this year, you know, like I don't call it timing. I have a more, 
I'm a little more on lockdown with the two kids and things. I have time. I have time in the office now, way more so than I did before. And you coming back and telling me, mm -hmm. like, hey, everything you like about the Halon X, you really need to look at this new bow. Mm -hmm. Then I started, like, you know, doing some mental gymnastics and thinking about, okay, what am I, what do I have? I got a bow, shoots extremely well, you know, 285 FPS, 70 pounds. 448 grain arrow, like everything's pretty average, you know, like mm -hmm. right there average. Shooting fixed blade G5 Montex, been shooting those since 2016 as well. Um, you know, a tattoo. I even have a tattoo a G5. back when I was dumb enough to get tattoos at things like broadheads. I got one on my wrist. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I have a G5 Montex tattooed on me. It literally going back to like those times. And I don't know, you, you piqued my interest in a new bow. And mm -hmm. I, timings, everything. I kind of had the time to like start digging in and diving in and doing a bunch of research and like understanding what I have and why I like it and everything that's coming out new. Like, man, I really could, I could beef this bow up, this new bow. Cause it's just so much faster than 2016 Halon. I think the IBO on the 16 Halon was like 325, mm -hmm. 326. This is 348. Mm -hmm. 343. 343. 43. Mm -hmm. on the, uh, IBO. Yep. So I'm like, Man, so <clears throat> I could pick up a heavy arrow or heavier arrow, mm -hmm. or I could go as heavy as I want. Um, and I can really start like dinking around with, with this and really getting familiar with my archery equipment. I, I feel a little guilty that I've hunted so much with a bow and like I've been able to harvest so much with my bow, but I've never truly like understood the bow itself. I've mm -hmm. always had great people around like Brady and you and, you know, getting bow set up. And by the time it gets handed to me, it's like better than a, any archery pro shop and the thing is just absolute nails when I start shooting it. So like, you know, mm -hmm. just pick it up and, and go. Well now, like I really wanted to understand archery as well. So I've just been diving in like crazy on, on that, like becoming my own personal <laughs> pro shop. So, so, now, so it was twofold. So you had an interest in doing your own yeah. work. So kind of doing your, being your own technician, if yeah. you will. And then and like really understanding it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, so feet per second. Was that, I, it's more so like what I don't, I don't want to just get a new bow and have the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want you to, want, you, you want it to be better in some regard. Yeah. Right? I want it to be different. Or otherwise, why would you get a new one? Exactly. Right? And I wanted it to be different. So Matthew's coming out with 80 pound mods. Like mm -hmm. that was a no brainer for me, like 70 pounds, not to sound like an asshole or anything, but like really easy. I mean, like too easy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, 80 pounds and I could go heavy and do 80% let off, get more FPS on a heavier arrow. Um, you know, buck wind better, all this stuff, cut arrows shorter with a heavier spine and mm -hmm. like all these differences that I could get into distances and sight tapes that would better fit, you mm -hmm. know, my hunting scenarios. But the hard part was, is that Halon X, I've killed everything from now a stone sheep with mm -hmm. it to, you know, to tiny little mule deer just for back in 2016. Yeah, you, know? you get a twinge of like regret when you look at your Halon X just resting in the corner. So, you now know what you got I, a new bow. you know what I did do? Did you shadow box it and hang it on your wall? No, <laughs> I I couldn't fully. I, think you I couldn't. It, it was really hard for me to put it down. I'm a loyal <clears throat> individual. Like yeah. I just I'm loyal about everything in my life, and like that's part of what's kept me with the Halon is it's been so good to me. Sure. Like I yeah, you, to, you develop some uh, affection, some yeah, affinity for a relationship. Yeah, I get, get it. I took the peep off of that, and oh, it. I it had over. to bring some, something. Something over. I had to bring something over, and that was a easily. Transferred, thing. um, you know, they got new all kinds of new shit. So, really, the only thing that works on that bow from <laughs> this bow is the peep sight, yeah. Um, so I brought that over just you know, out of nostalgia or whatever you yeah. want to call it. So, feet per second, obviously, faster you gain feet per second. Oh, yeah, on you a gain, heavier arrow, <clears throat> heavier arrow. So, you gain more, you also gain the, the ability to gain more draw weight. So, you went up to, Way, eight, yeah, 80, went up to 80 with 80 percent let off. Where 80 I was coming with, from 70 with 85 so more, percent more let off. Yeah, got it, or less let off. So, yeah. more speed. Gotcha. Um, anything else about the bow that you? I mean, when you shot the bow, you got the bow, obviously. You, yeah. you, you got it set up, right? You've, I've, I assume you've had a chance to shoot it. Yeah. Um, in relation to your Halon X or any other bow that you may have owned previously and shot, 
What other kinds of things do you notice about this bow? And would you say that it is a justifiable upgrade? Like if you were someone out there buying a new bow, you were looking at getting a new bow or, and you had an old bow that you loved like you yeah. for the, you, you love the Halon X. Are there things about this bow in your opinion? I mean, your honest opinion, like, is it worth the upgrade? Yes. Like a hundred percent. It's not even a question. And I've got a hundred, somewhere around a hundred or less arrows through it. Not mm-hmm. that much. And I can already, I already know this is, this is great for me. Like mm-hmm. this is definitely worth it for me. Time, energy, resources to put into this bow. Um, the very first thing I told you immediately, right when I shot it too, is the vibration difference between mm-hmm. the Halon to this is like, it's more than night and day. I don't even know. I don't even know how to explain it. Yeah. It's like the earth and the moon difference. Mm-hmm. It's crazy how different the feel is releasing an arrow from the Halon to this. Um, it's like, it's wildly different. And then the 80 pound, 80% let off. The one thing I've really noticed too is how sloppy, because it was light for me, is how sloppy I would be in the back wall mm-hmm. with that Halon just because it was so easy for me to hold. And it would I would make some pretty sloppy like breaking shots every once in a while just because it was too easy. And uh, this has really shown me, like, because it, it keeps wanting to jump on me, like those first 20, 30 arrows, I kept getting, like, jumped forward out of the back wall. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I really was sloppy. Like, now I know why I was making those shitty shots. <laughs> like, every once in a while, I'd have just a weird shot without practice, mm-hmm. any of that stuff. Do you um, notice any difference in the back wall? Because I think the, Huge difference yeah, in the I think that the, the lift is a whole lot more firm in the back wall. There's no movement. It's a lot harder back wall. There's it's, no sponge to it at all. It's not... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, in my opinion, so it's it's almost an in-betweener. It's not as hard as a limb stop because this isn't a limb stop. It's a cable stop, so you've got your stops that roll over. They roll into the cable, so you've still got just a smidge, in my opinion, of give. It's definitely not as hard as a true limb stop that you might get from another company like an Elite or a Bowtech or something like that, but um, it's infinitely harder than yeah. the switch weight cam, the old switch weight cam. Like, Do you like that? Like, a lot better trail? I do like it because I feel like I get a much more clean break. It's like a much more crisp release. So whereas you pull into the back wall on a switch weight, regular switch weight cam, like on my V3X, I've got ever so slight, you know, give, sponge right? Sponge, a little bit of, yeah, I'll call it a sponge, just what it feels like mm-hmm. a little bit. Uh, it felt to me like the break wasn't as clean. I like a hard back wall. And some of the best bows that I've ever owned that I shot the best had a really stiff back wall. And so I do like it. I think it's a pretty serious upgrade. And it's like a minor detail that maybe doesn't matter to a lot of people, but to me it matters quite a bit. I I like the back wall and the lift for sure. And I think it's due to the cam, the cam system, and then moving the axle to the top of the limb versus running the axle through the middle of the limb. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do like it. That was one of the things I noticed right out of the box. Yeah, and that's when you were talking to me too about about that why why I would like it and running me through that stuff. Trail is always what two or three pounds heavier on a bow scale on a draw weight bow scale because you pull so much harder into the back wall. wall. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but now like with this bow having you know a hundred hundred arrows through it, I'm pulling hard into the back wall Mm -hmm. now, which is exactly why I'm feeling so much better on each release. Mm -hmm. It's just like there's there's nowhere for any energy or emotion to go than just straight back off of the string. And it's, it's creating a Do you think really that's good feel. Got a little bit more benefit to you shooting a hinge off a harder back wall. Is there anything to be said there? I do. I think you just pull into it. Pull I mean, into it more yeah, consistently. It's just, just, just firmer. Yeah. And you, you just pull more consistently into it. Yeah. And I think, I think it just feels crisper. I don't know how else mm-hmm. to explain it. And I don't even know, I don't know if it's uh, like directly relates to a lot of accuracy because there's a lot of bows that have some sponge in the back wall and guys shot them extremely well. I just know that for me, I shoot better and it's just a crisper, cleaner break when I have a harder back wall. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. That was like one of the first things I noticed. The other thing I noticed about the bow when I pulled it out is just, and this is a consideration, we'll come, probably kind of tie these in. So back wall is one thing. I think it, it's like the overall feel of the bow. Um, you mentioned another thing is just the vibration going going through the riser. And for some people, I mean, I've shot target bows over the years and vibration for me has never been like a selling, like a major selling point for me. It's not like, Oh, I would stay away from that bow because it has a lot of feedback that goes through the riser. It's more of a feel thing. I don't necessarily know that like in a hunting situation, it matters all that much. It's definitely more efficient, right? If, if there's less vibration Mm -hmm. and less noise, 
But as far as like the accuracy of the bow, I don't know that I notice a huge difference between bows that have a lot of feedback and bows that don't have a ton of feedback. I think it's more of a, just a feel and it just depends on what you're used to. And obviously like dead in the hand, everybody talks about being dead in the hand. That bow yeah, is dead in the hand, dead in the hand. It's like, I mean, that is the thing people say. And it's true. I, it is dead in the hand. And I think that their bows in the last few years have all been really, you know, relatively dead in the hand, but for me, that's not like the take-home selling point for me in a bow, but it is dead in the hand, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Um, so that's one thing is just like the feel of the bow when it goes off. Um, I don't know that, it, like I said, I don't know that it directly translates to accuracy. It's just a feel thing, I think. Hmm. Um, you, do you ever notice that? Do you ever shoot a bow? You, I mean, it's just. To me, it's always been like, I can't really fit in a lot of bows. So that's yeah. always. Mm -hmm. A difficult thing for me to actually feel like it's shooting perfect for me because I have such a long drawing, 32 and a quarter. Good Lord. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so it's long. like I'm always Yikes. I'm always tinkering the strings, making things longer, a little longer D-loop, mm -hmm. trying to get comfortable so I'm not like leaning into everything. So sometimes the feel to me is just like, well, if the bow fits me, mm -hmm. it usually feels fairly decent. Gotcha. But I'm like, I, was, I want to say like, I do, I do love a hard back wall. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that... Yeah, I'm, that's what, I'm, that's what intrigues me about this. Because how do you think it compares to like? Because I, you know, still shoot the Halon X, or not Halon X. Sorry, Atlas. It's yeah. it's way harder. Than way the, harder than yeah, Atlas. Way harder because I uh. just I just put new strings on Cody's Atlas, uh, and I was tinkering around with it. It's way more spongy, mm -hmm. way more spongy than this bow. This bow definitely has as as far as Matthews goes. I mean, right up to, I mean, the only thing that you could do to make it a harder back wall is an actual limb stop. Yeah. It's the firmest back wall that a Matthews bow has had, in my opinion, that I can remember. And you've shot, you've shot them all. Yeah. I, the entire I can't lineup remember. all the way through. Yeah. I can't remember a Matthews bow that I haven't tinkered with or played with in the last probably, I mean, since the Q2, <laughs> it's yeah. 20 years ago, 22 years ago, something like that. That's dating you. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've owned a lot of Matthews bows. Um, so that's a good point though. You bring up draw length and I think that's probably one of the things that when you're considering buying a new bow, you know, you're going to go into a pro shop and shoot. And I, and that's what I would tell people like, you know, whether you decide on a Matthews or a Hoyt or whatever it is that you decide on, I, I think it would behoove you to go into a pro shop and shoot the different bows and have them set that bow up to your draw length. Um, I don't think that there's anything as critical in my opinion as draw length. I think it's the key to finding uh, a bow that fits you well, aims well, and then is going to be the most accurate for you. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you measure your draw length? Do you do the old the old equation? Yeah, like put your fist against the wall, measure it all the way back, or mm -hmm. you know, just I divide kinda, it by two and a half. Yeah, a wingspan divided by two and a half, mm -hmm. and that'll get you close. Um, Matthew's new bows and even the switch weight; those are on a mod system, so they come in half inch mods cool thing about these ones is that you can shift your draw weight so mm -hmm. like lorenzo's bow has 80 pound mods on a what 80 percent let off 80 percent let off and you can tinker with those mods so you could get a 70 pound mod mm -hmm. and an 85 percent let off and, and you, switch them and switch them out it's just two set screws per cam which is without a press which is a nice little uh, perk I noticed that a lot of the new bows, you're talking Hoyt or uh, Elite, those are available now in rotating mods on the cam, so you can adjust your draw length and your draw, your holding weight. Um, and you can also adjust your draw uh, length in those by quarter inch in some of those now, hmm. which is interesting because I'm, you know, I can adjust this to a half inch, but then I'm tinkering with, uh, and I did, I did a ton of tinkering with <laughs> D-loop length, you know, twisting cables, twisting strings, mm -hmm. playing with it in different draw lengths. And, you know, your draw length is, like I said, I think that's key. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you guys look at? Feet per second, you said. We already mentioned that. Yeah. I was, I was, you, you've shot the entire lineup <clears throat> all the way through up into mm -hmm. the lift, like literally every single one. It's pretty easy for me to like notice difference from 2016 to now, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, like I said, it, it's the earth and the moon as far as difference goes. But where I was coming from with it was just how different can the setup be and how would that fit my hunting scenarios? Like think about the last eight years. What would have I, what would I have liked to have different, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I started. So a heavier arrow, much heavier arrow and a lot faster mm -hmm. was like a great starting point for me. I'm yeah. like, okay, this is, 
I mean, I'm going to be able to be well over 500 grains and I'm going to be 290 plus, like yeah. easily 290 plus. Yeah. So right there, I'm like, okay, that's, that's a big difference, you know? Let me ask you about axle to axle because you have the Halon X, which is mm -hmm. a 35 inch axle to axle mm -hmm. bow, longer. Yep. 33 inches axle yep. to axle. This has got a bigger cam on it. Yep. Uh, any difference? Do you notice any difference in the way the bull holds or aims for you? I actually, the riser is longer on <clears throat> yeah, the lift. Much by longer. Quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So I actually think this holds better for me. I don't know what the magic is there or why that is, but it holds better for me than the Halon. And that's why I like the Halon so <clears throat> much. Is, it's like I told everyone it was like a Cadillac sedan for me. There's not one person who can get in a Cadillac sedan and be like, oh, that rides like shit. You know? <laughs> Everyone's like, doesn't look the best and you know it's not mm -hmm. flashy but like mm -hmm. that is the best ride ever that's how i felt about the halon is like every time i shot it i'm like just felt good every time like i never never felt weird or out of tune or like you know pushed past its limits everything was just dead solid on that bow you don't feel like you're giving anything up with the lift in a nothing, 30, 33 nothing there i honestly haven't noticed anything because of the riser difference gotcha do you always look towards a longer axle axle or could you shoot a smaller one or when would you I could shorter? shoot I could shoot it I don't like to shoot it <laughs> for what reason uh, I like a longer axle axle bow just because I think it is a little bit more forgiving I think it also fits my frame better at a 30 inch draw so that peep and the peep the string angle string and the angle, peep yeah. so it's closer to my eye on a longer axle axle bow um, I think for me, like 33 inches is about as short as I would like to go. Like the V3X I had, which is 31 and a half. I like that bow and I shot it pretty good. I didn't, I didn't love the string angle. It did felt like I like had to creep into my peep a little bit, like get, get down into the, mm -hmm. into my draw on my anchor point. Um, so I, for me, I like a longer axle axle bow. And to be completely honest, like if Matthews made a 34 or 35 or 36 inch axle axle hunting bow i'd shoot it because yeah. i just like a long axle axle bow i just think it's more comfortable uh for my frame i feel like it's more forgiving but i feel like 33 is kind of a good happy medium i feel like it's short enough that i could still hunt from a blind or a tree stand without giving up a whole lot um you know i can shoot thick country if i'm hunting elk and not feel like it's cumbersome to get mm -hmm. around with but i still feel like it's long enough that i shoot it pretty accurately uh and like lorenzo said the riser is just so damn long on these yeah, things it is. actually feels longer that's just like a, a matter of physics right so i mean you've probably all heard this but if you take a broom handle and you hold it in your hand and you try to wave that thing back and forth and then you compare that to like if you were to wave a pencil back and forth right so it's shorter right versus a broomstick you have just length it's just physics right so the longer the riser in your hand the more stable that thing is going to be so for me it's a long riser 33 inches is kind of as low as I would like to go. And they do make it a 29 and a half, which is probably great for guys that are hunting a tree stand or a blind. Just because um, it's more <clears throat> tight quarters. It's more compact. Yeah. And then guys that are shooting a shorter draw length, like if you're shooting a 27 inch draw or 28 inch draw, you know, and you're, you know, five foot seven or whatever it is, yeah. you know, five, eight, you're probably not giving up that much and it is faster. Um, and, and obviously there, there are some guys that can really shoot that bow accurately, probably at more accurately than I can. And a lot of it just comes down to mechanics mm -hmm. behind the bow. But for me, I do like a longer bow. Do you like longer brace? Yeah. For the same reason, um, you know, brace height on bows have gotten, you know, shorter and shorter. So the 33 is a six and a half inch brace. The 29 and a half inch is a six inch brace. Uh, it used to be pretty common when, you know, when I got into bow hunting that most of them were seven, Sevens. seven and a half, uh, yeah. even, uh, I think the Atlas is like seven and three quarters. So long brace height. Uh, what do you gain? You gain feet per second with a shorter brace height because the arrow is on your string longer, right? So it's a longer power stroke. Uh, what you potentially give up is that it can be a little bit more finicky because your form, your follow through has to hold that much longer. Uh, and everything that I've read and looked at, it's pretty, you know, it's relatively insignificant. You know, it's it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have to be a little a little bit tighter, I guess, with a shorter brace height. Uh, I mean, if you look at target bows, most of your target bows have longer brace height, and mm -hmm. that's for a reason. Longer axle, axle, longer brace height. It's just because it's that, it's that much more forgiving. And that's the thing when you're buying a hunting bow is you got to kind of make a decision on you know what are you, you know, like what are you ultimately looking for, right? Are you looking for a bow that is 
the most forgiving bow on the planet? Well, if you are, you're probably going to give up something in like feet per second, right? Which in turn can also cause you some issues. Um, you know, feel of the bow. It's probably not as quiet. A longer axle, axle, short or longer brace height is probably not going to be quite as efficient or as quiet, in my opinion. So it's probably going to get a little bit more feedback through the riser. So you're giving something up. It's kind of that happy medium you're trying to find, which is, I think, what Matthews has struck here with the in, in the 33, in my opinion, uh, is kind of a, a good happy medium, right? You have a decent brace height, six and a half, but it's still shooting, you know, IBO 343. So we throw the term forgiving mm -hmm. out a lot. How would you define the term forgiving when it comes to a bow? What do you think? Well, I, I look at it from, so I do want forgiveness. And that's the other thing with this bow too, which is why I was willing to change or take on the headache of change this year is I don't feel like I'm giving up much <clears throat> forgiveness at all from the hail on to this for all the reasons trail just said, but like hunting, I do forgiveness is a huge thing in my mind, right? Because in it hunting, has to be in hunting. Like I don't, I can't remember the last time I was flat footed standing yeah. drawn, like everything was just dead flat, like shooting a <laughs> target. You know what I mean? You're always bent over, like trying to wrap around a tree without getting your body silhouetted out from behind the tree or, you know, it's, it's always like an awkward stance thing, whatever. Um, so forgiveness for me is like, if you aren't just, perfectly dead nuts solid flat every axis point just leveled yeah. solid all like, your anchor points are perfectly all your anchor touching points are perfect like there needs to be 20 percent room for error 25 percent room for error there you know what mm -hmm. i mean and that's all subjective to everybody but like nope i'm holding you to it 25%. if i can't get <laughs> if i can't get the bow perfectly anchored and perfectly flat and perfectly this can i still make that shot yeah make it and like that shot. that's where that's a subjective forgiveness for me. And that's what, how I feel with this bow. I would say it's uh, forgiveness is like, if you shoot enough arrows, it's it's the arrows that break and you're like, oh shit. And it still lands close yeah, to middle. Exactly. Yeah. Like that's a forgiving bow to me. Oh, yeah. The the bow that you're like, ah, that one didn't feel good. You, it breaks, you know, it's not center. And you yeah. look down range and you're like, oh, that one actually is either landed middle or not far off yeah. middle. Like that that's how I would define and forgiveness. Co and Cody filmed this bow set up for me. Like I've just been setting it up mm -hmm. day after day, messing with it, everything and getting used to the 80% let off instead mm -hmm. of 85 and actually having to hold it in the back wall. When I was paper tuning, bear shop paper tuning, I'd be like, well, that was shitty. Like jumped on me and I released mm -hmm. bullet hole through the paper. Yeah. Like, okay. Hmm. This thing's, this thing's good. You're like, I knew that was a shitty release and it still came off great. But I think that's where forgiveness comes from. I think it's axle to axle length. I think it's brace height. I think it's just the efficiency of the bow. And then ultimately tune, like how tunable is the bow. Mm -hmm. And the better the bow is tuned, I think the more forgiving it's going to be, obviously. Yeah. It's going to hit middle. I want to jump into tuning eventually. We can, we, but, can hit, we can hit it now. What else you got? Well, I was going to talk about the limbs. Oh, yeah. So like Lorenzo's going from the Halon X, which is mm -hmm. Solid giant, limbs. giant limbs. Giant limbs. And they're you know one piece compared mm -hmm. to yeah. what we now have. They're split, eight. split. Yeah, mm -hmm. get eight, eight limbs, limbs, basically. How is that for you? Do you notice anything different between the lift and the Halon X limbs? I mean, I just, in the in the draw itself, like I notice it's like, I don't know, what's the word, trail, like more preloaded almost, like when I start to draw into this bow compared to yeah. the Halon. So it's, it's smoother there. Like that makes sense. This this to me feels like a more even pull throughout. Yeah. It doesn't feel, especially with the 80% 80, 80 mods. Yeah. So the eighty percent mods, I feel like it's a pretty even, steady pull. Like I don't feel much of a hump at all. Yeah. I've heard that uh, like the twenty nine and a half at the longer draw lengths, kind of the extent of that. And I would bet, I think this is thirty. Probably if you get to the full extent of this draw length, there's probably more of a hump. But if you're kind of in that sweet spot in terms of like what they offer in draw length, it's probably a pretty even pull. And I think t to me anyway, this is a, it's weird. Cause it's like a stiffer, it's a little bit stiffer, but it's more smooth. Would you say? Yeah, that's what, yeah. So it feels, that was a better way to explain it. Like it feels more preloaded. Mm -hmm. So it's like stiffer, but it's smooth the entire way through. Mm -hmm. Like it never changes. I don't feel any mm -hmm. change of like, there's no how real much strength hump. Them. It doesn't yeah. really dump into the back wall. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just feels straight the whole way, like solid the whole way. I would say, I mean, like the cams, if you look at the cams on the lift, they're more uh, closely resemble like some of the old speed bows, like a monster or what is the X-Force, I guess, from PSC. <laughs> 
Um, so they more closely resemble that in shape. So from a cam, like when I first pulled the bow out of the box and I looked at the cam, I was like, this is going to be a, an aggressive mother. Like this thing is going to want to rip, you know, my arm off. And just I, by looking at it. Just by thought. looking at it. Yeah, just sh sh shape of the cams. But I think the way that they've moved the axle to the top of the limb uh, and the way that it rotates through, I don't feel... I, I, can I, I owned a monster. I think my, I credit my, you know never ending case of target panic that I've battled my entire life with the monster. <laughs> I mean, that, that thing gave me target panic, like oh. flat out, um, shot that bow so great for the first week. And then, you know, the first time that that thing jumped out of my hand, I was never the same since, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I had flashbacks when I pulled the bow out of the box and I was just like, shit, those cams look aggressive, but they're not, they're really not. And mm -hmm. I think, like I said, I think it's just the, the way that they've moved that axle up and, and probably, whatever tech, what other, I don't know what else they've got built into that, but yeah. Yeah. It draws, draws smooth. Yeah. Um, did you notice any difference in, uh, like we've talked a little bit about feedback, vibration, mm -hmm. quiet noise, and we did some testing. I did a we review. Did. Yeah. It's a lot quieter than, <laughs> than the Halon X. Huh? That was, that was another like kind of shot to the heart there where I'm like, man, I really need to change because when you, when you had yours early and we did that, that, uh, decibel mm -hmm. meter, decibel meter. Mm -hmm. compared this bow to my halon we'll just, we'll just say it was very very noticeable can i mention something funny again yeah. real quick that we've talked about before so now you don't have to plug your ears when someone else is shooting a bow <laughs> like you did when your wife shot her elk that was just out of pure <laughs> pure <laughs> just excitement full fever right oh, there. i thought it was because it was a loud bow that's a, you know that's what i've told people a lot like everyone have we shared that yet killer that no we haven't shared it i've told this story on podcast before but like the whole oh you got to be a cold killer all that i'm the furthest thing from it and i have no like i will gladly tell people that internal battle for me because i do get so like out Excited. of control mm -hmm. yeah i love the internal battle of archery hunting to like mm -hmm. calm that down like my stone sheep right calm it down in the moment make sure everything's executed i love that battle but when i'm not having to battle and my wife is the one shooting I do things like plug my ears when she shoots a bow. So, you know, <laughs> and it's on film. That clip, we have to share that. No, we do. We do got it. I didn't know this. You haven't seen that no, video? Yeah. That's oh, hilarious. I've, He's literally plugging his ears yeah. she's when she's shooting a bow. A bow. <laughs> <laughs> it was an old bow. I, you know, <clears throat> so Matthew's Safe, prima. Safety first. That's yeah, hilarious. That yeah. But yeah, like that is, that is like the definition of how jacked up I get in the moment. Like, because sure. I didn't have to calm myself down there. I just kind of. Like it was all on her, so I just kind of I didn't have to have that internal like, you know, process or whatever. Yeah. But that's like if anybody wants to know how jacked up I get in the moment, yeah. that's how jacked. That's, up. that's what ass hunting's all about. Yeah. So what, do, do you remember what those numbers were? What the, oh, the decibel? I don't. Off no, top, but it, we could refer the video, video. But it was definitely quieter. For it sure. was a solid difference. Here's like what a, I noticed with this bus. So I've had a bunch of people ask me like, is it quieter than the Phase Four? Quieter than the V3X? Right. So I think it's quieter than the V3X because it's got this dampening, you know, rubber dampener between the limbs. So mm -hmm. I do think it's quieter. Uh, and compared to the Phase Four, and I've got a Phase Four over here, and I was doing some dinking around with it in my basement the other day. So as far as, far as noise goes, I think they're very similar. In, in sound this one i don't know how to explain it other than the noise feels shorter it feels quicker like hmm. the the when the bow goes off it's not like this prolonged reverb i don't know how to explain it other than that it just feels like the noise is is there and it's gone like it's quick it's much quicker hmm. I'm not a I'm not a pianist by any means, but it's like the difference of pressing the pedal mm -hmm. and then hitting the key, sure. or no pedal and hitting the key. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's the only way I can explain it. Is that it? I don't know if it's per se quieter as far as decibel goes in comparison to like a phase four, but I feel like the length of sound is quicker. Hmm. And here's here's a little here's a little tidbit that I haven't shared with anybody really. Oh, here it is. You hear it here first. Okay. So why? I've thought a lot about noise in a bow because like for a long time, Matthews, a lot of bow companies have chased noise, like noise in the bow. Right. I mean, we Matthews has chased it for a long time, like trying to work out the vibration, the noise that the bow makes when it goes off. And I've always thought, like, does it really matter that much? So I'm here to tell you it matters quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I missed an animal this year with this bow. I mean... I've never heard this. Yeah, I know. I haven't told anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so outright missed. Okay. And I didn't miss once. I missed twice. 
Okay. There's I don't know, no way. Yes. And I don't, I don't know if it's a range thing. I don't know what it was. I don't know if I was just amped up. Okay. But I missed this animal two times with an entire herd literally never picked their head up. What? Just, really? just really? stood there. Yep. This the buck an- you killed? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. That elk yeah. I shot in Colorado. I, mi- I missed it two times. So and just, they didn't hear the bow go off at did all. Did not hear the bow go off. I really? literally that. missed that. I missed that bull twice. I missed him at 62 yards, walked in, I missed him at like 58. And then I think he kind of finally settled in at like 55. And I just cut yardage. And I don't know if I was shooting over the top of him, which I think I was. But that's why it matters. Huh. So I never thought it mattered. I never was like, oh, that's not a big deal. But I can tell you that I had a herd of six cows. Literally never picked their head up. Wow. Just that kept, wouldn't have been the case with the Halon X. Just, no chance. Just kept feeding. The bull was aware because he's having arrows go over him. And he <laughs> just kind of, you know, sat there and was like, huh, huh, huh. But literally, I I, uh, I was blown away that an entire herd of elk from within 60 yards basically just like chilled out. I can't believe you didn't tell us that. I know. I didn't want to. You're usually like such an open book I was, when I you get I was saving it. <laughs> saving it for the podcast. It. What yeah, a guy. I told Derek Nelson. He he knows. But I. Uh, wow. So I'm later to know. Right? <laughs> I didn't want to yes. tell anybody because nobody wants to tell anybody that they missed, right? I'm supposed to be golden yeah, in, in the moment. The but, I, but I get jacked up. But yeah, I, I missed that bull. And I've had a lot of time to think about it. But I, I don't think that that happens if that bow is, you know, loud. loud. I think it. I never thought it mattered. But I do now. I'm a believer. <laughs> It's like suppressed and unsuppressed. We and talked about that. I don't know that you'll get that every single time, but in that environment, in that situation, on that animal, on that day, in that herd, yeah, it mattered. They just didn't yeah. seem to notice. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't That's notice. pretty quiet too. There's no way that happens with the halon because when we did that decibel testing, I was I was running safety. Mm-hmm. I was a uh, safety foreman. Is that what it's called? A safety foreman. Mm. Right? Yeah. I was I was blocking the out in the warehouse I was blocking the aisles that nobody could walk through because we were shooting a bow and when he would shoot his bow and then when he'd shoot the halon I knew I knew exactly which bow was which mm-hmm. I'm like oh that's mine like that was for sure mine and I could hear it I could hear exactly where it came from and I know this is super anecdotal because I don't have telescopic hearing and all this shit like elk do but like I I noticed I could tell exactly where it came from when he, we when he'd shoot his bow really the only thing I could hear was the whistle of the arrow and the target I'd never really heard the bow. So we're talking about, you said the whistle of the arrow. Do you think it's more important to have a quieter bow or quieter, quieter arrow? Or can you have a combination of the two to ultimately have the best setup? Like what do, you, what do you think really matters? Is it the bow or the arrow that's noisy? I think it's the arrow that's the most noisy. Yeah. yeah. I, but I think it's a more natural noise. It's not as like... Uh, the whistle? It's not as like interest peaking to an animal as like the, the thud of a loud yeah. bow. Yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't know. That'd be interesting to find out. I, I think arrows, I think they hear the arrow. I don't yeah. know. I'd be interested. We should do some testing actually just to see like at what distance do you not hear the bow go off yeah. and different bows. That would be interesting that to know. That would be really interesting. And again, that would be to the human ear and you're definitely going to have different results if you go to like an animal. But uh, yeah. I, I think a lot of cases, I think they hear the arrow. That's just my gut telling me. They have to hear the arrow. Yeah, I mean, it's the that, wh- that whistle, loud. you know, and like depends on what broadhead and veins you shoot. I mean, the stiffer the vein, the quieter the vein is going to be in flight. Uh, you know, anytime you got a vein that's malleable, right, yeah. it's rippling as it's yeah. cutting through the air, so you're making more sound. And then if you're shooting a broadhead that's vented, you're going to get that whistling as it's spinning yeah. through the and air. And again, I could sound like a total idiot here because it's completely anecdotal, but like you, you guys duck hunted in Montana, but you guys haven't like really duck hunted, right? I'm not a duck hunter. <laughs> Did you guys ever have birds cup and drop altitude right above you? No, but I've had magpies and shit fly over me and there the, you hear that. <laughs> it's the same to me. The, uh-huh. That that arrow noise, it reminds me of like, mm. you know, F-16 teal coming in and dumping altitude and have their wings cupped and flying fat. It's the same noise. It's like that. Really? I, have, I don't know. It like brings me back to a really that. good duck yeah. hunt. It, I'm telling you, and again, just me anecdotally, but like when I hear an arrow whistle, that's what I think of is like a, a group of ducks just like coming in, dropping altitude right on top of you. Mm-hmm. Sounds the exact same to me. That's why I say it's more of like a natural noise. Gotcha. Like bird whistle, that wind noise is more natural than like the thud of 
mm-hmm. string slapping something. So we're kind of talking about it in terms of like Western hunting then, like maybe a 40 yard, 50 yard mm-hmm. shot. So whistle is going to be more important. What about whitetail guys then? So you always see oh, guys they, missing whitetails because oh, the buck, buck duck, they the duck. buck duck's low. So is that the bow that well, they're really hearing or is that the well, arrow? Because those are shorter distances. The, the, could ter- be 30 the term yards. is duck the string, right? Yeah. Which I, I mean, if you take it at face value, they're ducking the, the, the sound Slap of the bow. The string. Yeah. So then a bow matters. Then a bow matters. Yeah. Well, yeah, white if, if you think matters. about it, speed of sound is what seven twenty something. You got me. What's the speed of, this, <laughs> uh, of sound? It's seven. Yeah. It's seven. It's in the seven hundreds. You're like a coos. Like they're oh, jumping. Coos come inside yeah. out. They're jumping man. everything. Yeah. Like you yeah. blink, and they're probably jumping because you're <laughs> blinking too loud. Yeah, they they come inside out. Yeah. So seven seventy is the speed of sound. So you team that up with a three hundred FPS mm-hmm. bow, like. The sound is getting there twice as fast. Gotcha. Yeah, I just more than twice. Well, yeah, way be, more than twice. As more fast. than twice as fast. Yeah, it's, it's, you can make per second guy. mile per hour. Not, not a math guy. To me, I just felt right? like like way faster. Yeah, but seven hundred fifty miles per hour in terms of feet per second. <laughs> that's gotta be. That's gotta be insane. <laughs> yeah, not a math guy here. All I can tell you is it's the noise is getting there way faster. So it's one, not as high as I thought it would be. 1,125 feet per second is noise, is the speed of sound, and your arrow is traveling at 300. 300. Yeah, 300. That's crazy. So there you go. It's getting it nice. is, what's that, three, four, four times? I'm not a math guy. Four times. Is, Google's <laughs> not <laughs> Google can't the do Google that. Google will tell you anything. <laughs> but honestly, if you think about it, that is actually pretty wild, right? It is duck in the string then. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I've seen deer come completely uncorked. Yeah, I mean, just at the sound. And I, I I, never used to be the guy that was like, I don't know that sound matters that much. But I just in this situation, and again, it's anecdotal because it's just that one situation. I just felt like, wow, I, I really genuinely felt like that made a difference. Yeah. Do you still see people putting, you know, cat whiskers, limb savers, slapping them on all over the bow, slapping them on the limbs like we used to way back in no. the day? Like, I don't see that I anymore. Don't. Yeah, Matthews has their monkey tails. I pulled mine off, but they've got the rubber monkey tail yeah, thing that goes those, under them. Uh, I see those, but I don't, you don't, and you got a, a string stop, I guess, which is pretty common on yeah. any, any bow sold now, but you don't see people you shooting. Remember those little, those little tiny oh, ones you can get Sam's, like half Sam's inch? Sam's limb savers yeah. that go between your limbs. Yeah. Yeah. The, the spider ones, they're just the yeah. big like ball of bunch of things yeah. yeah you used to be able to stick them on things like oh, side yeah, of those, yeah. the side of the riser there, like there was a whole market for them yeah. they had all kinds of little little ones and big ones yeah. and you put them between your limbs you just mm. don't see it anymore mm. i don't I, yeah i don't at all i just think yeah i think we've we've gotten to a a point where they're just so efficient you're and these bows i mean if you look at the difference between this and like uh you know, B3X, the limbs are beyond parallel. I mean, they're preloaded already, and you bring those back. And I think anytime you've got that much load, they're essentially canceling each other out. So noise and vibration are essentially canceled, um, which any bow I've ever shot that was real preloaded was like that. It was relatively dead in the hand and more quiet than, you know, longer limbs that are, mm-hmm. aren't as preloaded. Again, I don't claim to know that I'm not an engineer. Mark's probably rolling over somewhere right now in, <laughs> yeah. in Wisconsin. Like, what you are you talking like, about? Oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> moron. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I mean. You love the bow. Yeah. I Here's the thing is like sometimes I'll get a bow and I, I'll admit it. I didn't love my phase four and I maybe I got a lemon and I, I don't know if I did or not, but I, I feel okay with saying it. I didn't love that bow as much as I love my V3X and it could be just, I had a lot of nostalgia with my V3X. I had some successful hunts with it. felt like I always aimed and shot it well. My phase four, uh, I just didn't take to that bow is like I did the V3X. And so I studied with the V3X. In fact, that buck I shot in Utah this yeah. year, I shot it with my V3X because I just had tons of confidence in that bow. Uh, this bow, I pulled out of the box, set it up. And like I said, within four days of like shooting every day at the range after it tuned, I was like, yeah, man, this bow slaps. This bow slaps. It's a cool kid. Way to sneak that one This bow slaps. Dude, yeah. we're cool, man. We I just, get it. I just took to it. And sometimes I think you do. I think you get a bow mm. that you just take to. And I, I took really easily to it. So let's talk tuning. Yeah. Did you do anything different tuning in this bow than your other bows? Do you have to tinker with a lot of top hats or is it relatively easy I did to have to move my top hats, but I think a lot of that is... Uh, you know, it's grip specific. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these bows, if you look at them, they come with the engage grip. Uh, so it's just a nice rubber grip, which by no means is a bad grip. It's just not my favorite. Uh, I've always kind of got deep into the grip. 
I have kind of a deep low grip, I would say. And so I've shot mine off the riser. So I wrapped it in tennis racket tape and you know, that's going to affect your tune. Mm -hmm. So I did have to swap my top hats, which top hats, I mean, we've, we've done videos on them, but essentially what it is, it's a means to move your cams left or right. And you can use that as a method of tuning. So you can get a top hat kit, which are different uh, widths of yep. top hats. You do have to pull the cam, so you have to have a press, but it's a simple process. You just pull the cam out, you swip, swap the top hats, and push your cams either left or right. So, yeah, so you got yeah, a little, little spacer, essentially. And it's pretty straightforward. So if you get a left tear, left paper tear, you move your cams left. You get a right paper tear, you move your cams So you'd right. put in the bigger top hat on the right side. Yeah, you just shift, shift your cam one way or the other. Or you'd put a smaller top hat on the left side. What would you do? So you come... Uh, so you just, so like, for example, this one, you can see that I've got the thicker top hat on the right side. So if I was getting a, uh, what a right paper tear, I could shift this cam back to the right by just swipping, swapping the thicker spacer to the left side yep. and then the smaller one. So you just flip them. They come in pairs. So they're, they're paired together. And if you pull these top hats out, you'll see they have a marker, like a ring around it. And it'll either be at the bottom, the middle, or you might have two rings, and that would indicate that you have a pair, right? So you just find two that are paired. Hmm. Um, you know, there's there's other companies that do it different ways. There's companies that use a set screw to, you know, rotate the limb cup. Um, I actually really like this, even though you do have to have a press. I feel like it's more stationary, like it's solid. Hmm. It's it's not like a bolt that can yeah. back out or do anything different once it's in it's once it's in, in it's in like that's yeah. where your cam is so even though you have to have a press to swap them i feel like once i get them swapped and i get it tuned like it's there yeah it's not gonna move so i, I do like that um timing was easy i mean matthews has the timing holes which is kind of nice you've got where your cable runs through your timing hole mm -hmm. here on the bottom just for a starter i'll just match that on both the top and the bottom and you do that just by twisting cables do you like a top cam to hit for the bottom cam type of person? Do you like them hit the exact same time? I like mine to hit exactly the same time. Yeah. I just match them up so they're hitting exactly the same. Uh, and then I set my center shot dead nuts between the cams. And that's my starting point. First yep. step for me, my, my cams are timed. And then I tie my knock set in dead center of the string. And then I set it level uh, through the rest. And then I just start tuning. But I, I didn't really have to have... Um, you know, I did, I did a bunch of tinkering just for fun. Mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, there are people that, f you know, they feel like a bow aims better if one cam is hitting, you know, slightly yeah. above the other. There is some, some things that you can do there and you can monkey around with that. But then you're going to have to adjust your rest height to, to accompany uh, the paper the tune or the tune. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, mine, mine was pretty well dead set from factory. Uh, you know, cams were easy to time. It tuned super easy. Do you find yours was easy to tune? Extremely. Yeah. Have a twist in, in time. Or no, it was, that was the VXR. This one was in time out from the fact, perfect time from the factory. Yeah, the mm -hmm. VXR was a half twist and that was good. And then this one is. Um, gotcha. Because I started messing with that VXR mm -hmm. before this bow so I could get mm -hmm. real comfortable with what I wanted to do and how I wanted to set it up. That one was half a twist and then this one was in time perfectly. Mm -hmm. and tuning you just recently got into doing your yeah. own stuff um part of this i wanted to cover was like what were your i mean what would you're brand new to it oh i am brand like you're new. two weeks three weeks into kind of your own process and you've set your own bows up the last three weeks three weeks i, should, I set that vxr up to just get comfortable before i started working on this bow mm -hmm. that i wanted to use it's your practice bow yeah practice it's my practice bow. bow and i did a bunch of I, I messed with that bow all over the place twisted it up twisted it down messed with uh, draw length, everything. Was it as intimidating? I think people think that it's intimidating. Did, were you intimidated by, by the process prior to this? Prior to, yeah. Okay. But for a lot of different reasons, just because I knew if I get into this, like I'm sure I'm you're gonna be into it. This. Like I'm, I'm done. Like I have a bow press in my office now. Like in my office, I brought it out from the closet to like in mm -hmm. my office. Um, so you stole my bow press? I did. <laughs> I did steal Brady. Well. Technically, did I steal it? Because nope. it was here anyways. I, I, I leave it here for office use. I'm just using it more than I'm I glad, ever I'm glad it's getting have. used. <laughs> I'm glad it's getting used. Um, but, uh, and, and just like, oh, am I going to fuck this up kind of a thing? Like, am I going to be able to put a bow in my own hand that's 
as good as trail handing it to me. It's kind of was the thought in my head, if I'm just being completely honest. And, uh, yeah, it's once you get going, it's not intimidating at all. Was it easier than you thought? Wildly easier than I thought. Best. And like more fun than I thought. I thought it was going to be just headache after headache. Oh shit. I got this problem. I don't yeah. know, whatever. It well, can be, like, but <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sure like you've told me a story you, you, about you'll, a bow. You'll probably get a bow every now and then that is a headache. Yeah. Well, this one, like, well, I like this. Ah, I want to change it. Uh-huh. It's like you go back and change it. And it's like, ah, That's I like that. That's the best thing about well, having your own gear. It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like I, I tinkered a bunch with D loop length on this just for fun. And that's I've done that. And too. I would just change out my D loop length. Uh, I messed a bunch with, you know, twisting cables in to make my draw length a little bit different and yeah. you know, go up, see how it would aim. That's the best part about having your own equipment. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. My my work has suffered. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Like I like I literally I've been late to meetings i'm like oh shit yep i got a meeting but i'm on the bow press like having fun yeah. so uh, at first i thought it was going to be like a headache and intimidating but it's fun i like it the biggest benefit i always thought is like well you know how to work on your own equipment you know how to tune in you now you know how to fix problems if something ever yeah. arises now in the field if you have to tie a new d-loop you know how to tie a new, d- new d-loop oh, yeah. if Easy. you're you know rest cord breaks you know how to fix it in the field yep. like you're starting to if learn how to manipulate things to make mm-hmm. it work yeah. and and know exactly what everything's doing. So yeah. one day you're out shooting. Oh, it's because of this. I need to go back yeah. home. And that's where I stuff. did feel guilty. Is like I bow hunt so much, and I've been able to hunt so many different animals and kill so many different ones with a bow. It's like I gotta, I gotta know what this thing is. You know what I mean? Like I've started to, and mm-hmm. just instead of texting you and bothering you on your, yeah. on your downtime, like ah, I should probably figure this out on my own. The, the one scary thing I remember when I first got into bow tuning way back in the day was like when you tie your first D loop. <laughs> Pull it back. Is, is that sucker <laughs> gonna hold her mind and just smack my nose and you know what I've my been doing? Up. Every time I tie a new D loop, because I've tried a bunch of different materials, tried the lengths, all this stuff. Every time I've probably tied between the BXR and this bow, I've probably tied more than a dozen D loops already in three weeks just to mess around. I put it on the drawboard with the safety mm. and I just let it sit for five minutes. And I just let it sit and tighten yeah, it. I'm like, well, if it can hold there for five minutes, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I think the most intimidating thing is like the first time you you pop a string off a cam mm. or a cable, like the first thing you think you pull that off the post. And then like, it, for example, I think probably the one of the first things that somebody does is like change out their strings and cables. Right. And when you start swapping that, I remember the first time I started doing it, I was like, Oh shit. Now what goes where? Cause it seems like there's just strings and cables everywhere. You know, going yeah. everywhere. It's so like the thing I've always told people is like you have a phone in your pocket, just take a picture, take a picture of it and just document everything as you go. Do one at a time. So if you're going to do your string, do your string first, relax the bow, look at it, make sure everything looks good and yep. just do mm-hmm. one end of a cable and work it to the other end. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward once you do it and there's no need to be scared of it. And that's where I started was full string change on the VXR. Mm-hmm. Like I wanted to start from like ground zero. Mm-hmm. So I got those ABB bow strings from the yeah. shop and that's that's where I started to like, okay, if I'm, I'm going to need to know what these are, where they go, you know? Yeah. And it was at first, it did seem like there were strings everywhere. Yeah. And then you look at it and you're like, well, that clearly goes there. <laughs> oh, well, that's labeled <laughs> yeah. C for cable. That's labeled S for string. Like it's pretty yeah. simple. <laughs> yeah. It's not nearly as bad as you no. think. But then even just getting used to, you know, when you like, when you put in a press, making sure before you relax the press that your string and cables straight. are all yeah. in there, everything's smooth. You don't want to have something bad happen, but it's just yeah. like getting confident and working on, which like, that's why you had, you know, you had one of your old bows just use yeah. as a practice tuner bow. The yeah. thing I like about it is sometimes it feels like you're, you're, you're doing a puzzle like when you're tuning a bow yeah. and you're tinkering with it and you're, you know, take a you know, twist out of a cable and add a twist and you, you're looking at cam timing and you're shooting it through paper. You know, you're getting a result through paper and you're problem solving as you go. You're yeah. like, OK, I could do this. I could move my top hats. I could move my rest. OK, I've got a high tear or a low tear. That might be a cam issue. It feels like I'm solving a puzzle yeah. or a problem as I'm working along. And then. Like that sense of satisfaction when you get it to a point and you shoot it through paper and it's just bullet holeing every time. And you bear go out, shaft, yeah, paper bear tune shaft. bullet hole, and you're like, oh boy. Yeah, or you, here you, go, we go. you go out and you shoot a bear shaft at yeah. 20 or 30 yards and it's hitting with your, your fletched arrows. It's a it's a good feeling, man. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm a geek when it comes to archery, but I, I don't think there's anything better. It's like one of the most simple, purest pleasures of my life. Well, what, did I, what did I text you when I got that first bullet hole? You remember I can't I remember. You? No, but you were stoked. I know that. I was <laughs> like, this is almost as good as killing a stone yeah, with right. a bow. <laughs> yeah, said, Well, just kidding. But it does <laughs> yeah. feel really good. One lead to the other. Yeah. Yeah. It's a do good you, good feeling. Do you think you're ever not tinkering on a bow? 
Do you, do you ever reach a point where like this feels perfect? I don't have to tinker anymore. I wish I were, but I'm not. I'm always playing. Yeah. So how how would you Which determine? Sucks. <laughs> how would you determine if you need to keep tinkering are you putting up a vegas face and shooting for score and then seeing if you have to you know adjust cams here there tweak stabilizers adjust weights you know like or how are you determining well, how much more you're doing i i shoot at my local range and i shoot most every day and if i have a day well i'll, I'll shoot for score sometimes i'm better at keeping it than others you know but i usually shoot like four arrows per end and I'll kind of keep score of how many I drop. I don't keep score or anything else. It's just like mm -hmm. how many arrows, if I shoot 14 targets, four arrows per target, like how many did I drop? So that's kind of like how I gauge it. Uh, when I really start tinkering is like if I have a day that it feels like the bow's not aiming or shooting well and I just start in my head, things oh, start. Oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, maybe I'm going to drop an ounce off of my back bar. Maybe I'm going to change the angle of it. Maybe I want to, you know, tilt it or add another two ounces to my front bar. Maybe I want to slide the front bar back a little. And I, what I do is I'll, I'll make changes to my setup and I'll shoot for two or three days and see if I feel like my scores are better. It feels like it's holding better. If it feels like I'm dropping, you know, less points and around, mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of how I gauge it. And I would say typically I want to have my bow set and kind of wrapped up at least like a week before I leave on a hunt, but it's not been uncommon for me to, make some slight changes. Usually yeah. my windage on my, on my mm. site is the one that like I'm tinkering with maybe mm. a day or before I go to honey. <laughs> <laughs> maybe on the way to, I may have made some changes like in Nevada to my windage. Yeah. Just, I'm not just at, at camp, you know, really? just shooting a little right. I was like, yeah, I'm going to bump that over, give it like five clicks to the right and just see. Yeah. So yeah, I'm always, always kind of tinkering with Where that. I'm having fun tinkering right now is arrow set up. Yeah. Because I'm I'm from scratch. Mm -hmm. So right now I have that 448, which is where I came from, 448 grain, mm -hmm. 300 spine. I've gone to a, a 505 grain, uh, 235 spine. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a 565 grain, 250 spine. And mm -hmm. I've just been like messing with those. It's been fun. That's been a lot of fun. It's fun to play with feet per second and grains and, yeah, and weights and, and, and different configurations. How they're hitting paper and mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's it's awesome. Yeah. You ever start messing around with the brass knock sets on the string and move them, stack them a little bit closer. Let's go half inch away. Let's group them half inch apart, quarter not, inch apart, I'm gonna four cut, bottom. I'm, not there. I'm gonna cut myself off before I get to <laughs> That's things what I used like to that. do back in the day. Yeah, I'm gonna like, cut I'm gonna myself off there. Mess around <clears> with it. Yeah. We didn't talk about this, but I wanted to. Oh. Oh yeah. Yeah. What does it look like you got in your hand? So I think we can officially start to talk about this. Can I we? saw yeah, okay. I saw Lancaster was talking a little bit about it. So I feel like I'm I'm in the clear to go okay. ahead and give it a so this is new. Uh I've had this I think since the phase four came out. Yeah. So I've had it for about a year and a half, I want to say at this point, but this little shot sensor. So this is basically a little micro chip sensor that like goes this. in the grip. Explain the size for people who are listening. It's probably what inch and a half, I would say, tiny by a half inch. Uh, fits under your grip, so you'll see in these new bows, the phase four, and then also the lift. Uh, it's got a little groove, little slot that you can fit that thing in. It's rechargeable with a uh, S, not S, what is that? C, USB C, USB C. USB -C. Yeah. Uh, you recharge it, but it works with an app on your phone, so you download the app. You use the sensor, you get it charged, you set it up. But this has been super cool to play with. Um, and I heard today, actually on the way down, I was talking to the guy, just texting him back and forth, that this will go live to the app store probably by the time this podcast, maybe maybe not by the time this podcast comes out, but within a week. Hmm. You'll be able to purchase and download, it sounds like. But essentially what it does is it's a sensor in your grip that gives you real time feedback. So you shoot an arrow, uh, you can check the app on your phone and it's gonna upload that shot, Bluetooth to your phone. It's gonna give you all kinds of information like where your level was throughout your shot process. So like the length of your draw, where your bubble was when it went off. Hmm. Uh, it's gonna tell you your, your hold time and then your aim time. Uh, it's gonna give you your torque. So like how much torque you had in the bow and the arrow went off. It's going to give you uh, your aim pattern, which is super cool. It's got this thing where it's it's actually slidable, so you can look pre-shot, post-shot. 
So you can see your configuration on a circle on the app and you can see where your float is and you can see where the shot broke and you can see what your bow did post shot. Uh, you can also use it to set up your levels in your bow. So you can set your second and I believe your third access level also using really? this little sensor. <laughs> yeah. And it keeps track of your shots and it also gives you like an overall score. And it's basically like out of a hundred and it kind of tallies, um, you know, your aim, uh, your torque, um, you know, how consistent you are within your window of aim time and release. Um, and then I'm un my understanding is that they'll be able you'll be able to uh, link together with other people and maybe even potentially do like leagues Gaming. remotely. Yeah, yeah. That'd be so cool. we can have a go hunt league from wherever you're at. That'd be cool. We could shoot leagues, but the cool thing about it that I found is it's made me way more aware of uh, like my hold, my pattern, like where I come in from. What does yours look like? Mine usually comes in from top left uh, down into the dot and it kind of rotates. And then as I follow through, it kind of dips low left. So oh. for me, I could actually, that's the interesting it's thing like a about pattern coming in from yeah, the left and then going yeah. back out. Oh. That's the interesting thing about it is that you can use it to, to help develop your stabilizer setup. So if you want to, you know, work and more precisely work on your follow through with your weights and your angle and both your horizontal and your vertical angle on your back bar, you could tinker with that to adjust your aim and your follow through. Um, like I said, you could adjust your levels, which is pretty sick. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked to those guys. They've said it's been really cool. Like they've, they've uh, literally been in a tree stand, shot a deer and pulled up the app <laughs> and they're like, Okay, that's where it was when it went off. Like, you know, based on where I was aiming, they can tell their hold time, release time, their fall through, and also where their bubble was when it went off. So, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Like, that's awesome. You're basically, seeing <clears throat> from shooting targets how you might naturally aim and hold and level, mm -hmm. what happens when you throw an animal in front of you if you're breaking down, sure. or you can go into a tournament situation mm -hmm. and be like, all right, I do break down in a tournament, or I, because of the nerves, I'm you know, pulling my bow left every time. So maybe I needed to make some tweaks or work on some t shooting mm -hmm. techniques and practice and fix that. The real value I see in it is just consciousness. Like it's, I'm so much more conscious of my shot when I have this in and I'm checking it and I might not check it every single shot. What I'll do typically is like leave it in and I'll go out and shoot around and come back and you can compare across all the arrows that you shot but you're starting to see patterns. Like you can see a pattern from where your bubble is when your shot breaks and you're like, Oh, I need to fix that because yeah. I'm either left or right, you know, and you can develop a pattern and then you can adjust your stabilizer setup to account for that. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see things like your habits and your aiming pattern, you know, and you can calculate that and, yeah. and adjust it out. So like you said, we've, you've had one for a long time. We've mm -hmm. heard about it a year ago. What were your initial thoughts? when they told you about that because like this is badass yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that was my first thought was like this is sick yeah like it it works with the app on my phone and like i can do all this cool shit with it i still remember the one thing i told you right when that came out and it's obviously for a bow but i was like come on rifle company sure put something out on my rifle so i can see my natural mm -hmm. aim my how i'm holding when i'm breaking the shot like all oh, that crazy stuff like that'd be so cool and yeah, it's I'm, like yeah you are adding you're adding tech Mm -hmm. to something, but it's tech for a good reason. I mean, you're getting more proficient. I think anytime that you can collect more information that can help you in turn to make you more accurate, a better archer. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't know that this is for everybody. Like maybe it's not for somebody that just pulls their bow out every now and then and wants to, you know, flip a few, get ready for the season. Yeah. But for the guy that's like shooting all the time and you're actively working and trying to get better at, uh, you know, all the different facets of archery, I think it makes a ton of sense. I think I'm, I'm super excited about it. So does it, does the app store all that into it? Mm-hmm. So you can go, you can go look back. You can look back. You can, it saves every arrow that you shoot. What kind of initial, is there an initial setup to it? Yeah. Do you have to enter a bunch of stuff in there? Like, uh, you pair, pair it to your bow. Okay. Yeah. There's an initial setup portion. It walks y'all through it. Super easy. How does it know it's initially level? Is there like, do you have to kind of set it, set your bow up level first? I'm trying, to, match it? I'm trying to remember. I don't think so. Okay. I think you can, you can put the sensor in and you can pull it up on your app and move your bow and to level because it's a mm. sensor. It's going to level itself. Okay. Yep, yep. Yep. I get you now. Yeah. That's, and that's part of the reason you can use it to, you know, level your, your axes in your side as well. It's pretty sick. Yeah. I'm excited for that. 
like very excited. Do you know what the cost is? I don't. I don't know anything about it other than you used it and you love it and it blew I you used, away. Other than I think it is, as far as archery goes, I think it's one of the coolest pieces of tech that's come around in a while. Did you ever think that it'll be on a bow? Like I can't. No. Like like, like that thought of creating that. Like who had that idea? Because that's a million dollar idea right there. Just <laughs> genius. I'm Let's sure, track I'm sure they're hoping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No question. Like yeah. to me, to me as like a tinker and someone who wants to become better at everything I do, especially around hunting stuff, it's like, it makes sense to me. More yeah. data, I can collect it. I can record it. I can write things down. I can see what's impacting what. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is it stores everything. I mean, it, and you can compare day over day, I mean, month over month. And I think once they incorporate the ability to, you know, play games or a social aspect of yeah. that. Like, I think it would be so cool if, you know, me, Lorenzo, Neville, you, you know, whoever else, Cody. A bunch of insiders. A bunch of insiders. We could have just a, yeah, a go a league. tournament. League. Yeah, you're like, okay, Monday nights, we're going to shoot a Vegas face. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that you're going to track awesome. your score, and you could essentially shoot a league remotely, and you could see, I could see his data, he could see mine. I think it's, the, the possibilities are so sick. Yeah, <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped about it. I think it'll be really cool. So that's... Shot sense. What does it weigh? Can I see it? Not much. <laughs> I, don't even think, I don't even think weigh that. It's like not what? much. Less weighs than like an ounce for four sure. Four fletchings. Yeah. <laughs> it literally yeah. Yeah, it's doesn't super, weigh anything. Super light. Yep. Huh. And those will, uh, you can get it. They've got the grip. You can see a shot sense with the little window, or you can do it with side plates, which has the built in little window as well. Or like mine, you can just shove it under the wrap and use it. You kept this under wrap pretty well. Kept trailer. it under wrap, yeah, for Proud a long you. time. You're so good at keeping secrets. <laughs> oh, oh. So do, you listen, good. Do, do you listen to all, the entire Suppressor podcast? Do you yeah. say I kind of threw you under the bus uh, a little bit? Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was I, like, Trail, like, did you give me any photos to market the new Matthews lift? He's like, no, no. I was so nervous about leak. <laughs> yeah. Like someone seeing my photos, I didn't take a single I photo of the I lift. Take it, I take it serious. You did? <laughs> yeah. Even though we needed to talk about it. But, no, hey. I, take it, I take it serious, the old non-disclosure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Overall, I guess we could wrap this up and just maybe give final thoughts. Uh, I guess I would say if you're looking at buying a new bow, go into a bow shop, shoot as many bows as you possibly can, have them measure your draw length. Uh, like I said, wingspan divided by two and a half will get you close. Uh, what do I look for in a bow? Uh, I look for speed for one, because that matters to me in a hunting situation as far as accuracy i want a flat shooting bow because if i misjudge yardage like i may have done a time or two <laughs> um Not a payoff. It, it matters uh i look for a bow being quiet obviously that makes <laughs> obviously a difference that matters, too. <laughs> that matters uh a bow that's forgiving I like a longer axle bow. Uh, not everybody but you know you want to definitely buy a bow that fits your hunting situation and your hunting style uh, draw weight is worth considering. I love the fact that you can use the switch weights in this to get whatever draw weight you want. And I will say Lorenzo's bow is an 80 pound bow. Uh, I've been a huge wuss when it comes it's to draw so weight. Easy. Yeah. I, I drew his bow so easy. I could shoot 80 pounds in this bow. I wish they made a 90 pound mod now. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I could shoot 80 pounds in this bow comfortably. Yeah. And I didn't know that that would be the case. One more thing. Sorry. Yeah. Do you consider mass weight of a bow? And oh. So it's a fine deciding factor. Do you like the light bow? Like does bear, I'm talking bare bow, mm -hmm. no accessories on it yet. Does that pay, pay dividends to you when you look at a bow? It, it does because, one, you have to carry the thing everywhere carry. you go, right? So if I wanted to set this bow up, this bow is only 4.26 pounds bare bow versus I think the other phase four was maybe four to five ounces heavier. It does matter to me because one, if I'm going backpack hunting for mountain goats or elk and I want to lighten the bow up, I like the fact that it's less weight. But more importantly than that, I like the fact that I can add weight where I want it, which is like out away from the riser. Like if I could ditch five ounces here and I could add it out here, I would do that. Because it's going to be better shot. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to aim and hold better. Yeah. So I do. I love the fact. And that was one thing I know... Uh, you know, I met up with Neville at the trailhead and showed him the bow. He picked it up. That was the very first thing he said. He was like, damn, that thing's light. Mm. Yeah, I feel like an idiot. That's what I should have said first. <laughs> when I when I pulled it out of the mm -hmm. box, I literally, it, he was filming, and I pulled it out of the box. I'm like, holy shit, I don't even, like, I feel like I'm holding nothing compared it's to what I'm coming lift. from. It's, it's notab light. notably oh, it's lighter. It's so light. 
Hmm. Everybody I've talked to so far that shot one has all said the same thing. Man, the thing's so light. light. When I picked it up with nothing on it out of the box, mm-hmm. I'm like, what is this? Like, yeah. I don't even feel like I'm holding something. Yeah, it's super, super light. And I do, like I, like I said, my bow may end up weighing the same. <laughs> but in different spots. But in different spots, yeah. which yeah. to me which matters. Which is what you want. I will say this one, though, I've set up. I've got three ounces out front. I've got five, I think, out the back with the extra little Matthews uh, dampener things that go in him. So I'm, this bow is probably, I'll bet it's close to a half a pound lighter than my V3X fully set up, which matters when you're packing it around in the elk woods. And I don't feel like I'm giving up anything in accuracy. Yeah. So then you talk about hold, right? Like uh-huh. hold, hold time and weight. That's mm-hmm. a big difference. Yep. Yep. So those are all things I would say are worth considering. Um, you know, I'd, I like the bridge lock technology where you've got the stabilizers oh, mounted right that. within the riser. It, it's clean. You've got your sight that mounts directly in the riser, which is clean. Same with the rest. It's all dovetailed in. Uh, last thing I guess I would say is um, I feel like across archery, not, not just Matthews, but across multiple manufacturers, I feel like this is the best year in a long time from a lot of companies. And I would say that as far as Matthews goes, this is the biggest jump they've made in a bow and in technology in probably maybe since, I mean, I'm trying to remember, a long time, probably five years, six years, I would say. Eight years. Eight, eight, year, eight, eight years. years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, new cams, yeah. you know, new limb technology, new position of the limbs, longer riser, lighter, you know, all the addition of the bridge lock. So I would say like, if you've been kind of holding off, on getting a bow, I think this is a really strong year, regardless of whether you're looking at Hoyt Matthews, you know, any elite PSE. I think that this PSE, is an awesome year. That new PSE, the mm-hmm. look of that bow is pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. I, there's a lot of nice bows on the market right now. Now, I and I genuinely mean this, like I would still shoot this lift. I just, Matthews to me, I, I'm brand loyal. And mm-hmm. I have, I shot Matthews before, shot Prime, then I shot Hoyt. Then I shot Matthews. Even before we worked with Matthews, I was into Matthews. Um, and I'm just loyal there. But looks wise, that like futuristic looking PSE mm-hmm. is pretty badass. <laughs> that thing's pretty cool. Yeah. It's There's like a lot the, of cool looking bows. The full, just the full riser, no cutouts, no nothing. It's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know how that would hold in the wind, which is what I thought when I first it's like my first thought. like con to it. Because mm-hmm. when I first saw it, I was shooting with a guy in Canada that had it. Um, after my stone sheep hunt and I'm like, damn, that thing looks cool. Mm-hmm. You know, like that was my first. And then the first con I thought was wind hold and I don't know. It's just one big mass. Mm-hmm. It was an interesting yeah. thought. I just like, I love the advancement in, you know, in all things archery. I, yeah. I love the push. I love the, I like the fact that Hoyt this year went to quarter inch increment draw, draw lengths and, yeah. and, uh, the ability to adjust your let off more precisely. Like, I think that's a sick ad yeah. for them. You know what I mean? Like any kind of adjustment that you can make in the ability to tune the bow more easily. Like for I like you for, yeah. for you. I yeah. think it's awesome. Um, you know, I like the top hat system here just because like I said, it's stationary, but I love the fact that you can do that now versus some of the older bows. It's like you get what you get. You're, You're not moving the rest. You, you can try to shim your cans with some yeah. shims or something, but like you, you kind of get what you get and you move the rest yeah. and make do. And sometimes your arrows rest. sticking yeah. out, at, you know, 40 degrees to the left yeah. <laughs> shoots a bullet hole, but looks weird. But yeah. I, I, I just love the fact that everybody's kind of headed that direction as far as making it more your, your own. I can't imagine how hard it is to every year to keep advancing, to keep working on things, to keep tinkering. Like, I think this is a huge, I think this yeah. is like, I mean, this is as technologically uh, advanced as anything I ever thought I would see in a bow. I'm really excited for that. It'll be interesting to see where they take this and what what the possibilities of it are. But I I don't know. Pretty cool. If you were to design a bow. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent again. (laughs) I have so many questions. (laughs) Ask them. If you were designing a bow right now, Mm -hmm. okay, based on whatever, like, well, what, what additions... Or what things have you thought of that would be potentially a benefit for you as a bow hunter first on a bow that you could think of that oh. you would like to see? Like your dream bow. <laughs> My dream bow would be like 35 inches axle axle, okay. I think, hunting like, bow. Yeah, like I, said, I like a longer bow. I just like the way it feels, mm-hmm. shoots. Uh, 
you know, feet per second. This one's, I'm shooting 296 with this bow with a 460 grain arrow. Um, so speed is obviously worth And you're consider- at 70 pounds. 70 so pounds. That's, that's 70 bad. pounds, 80% mm-hmm. let off. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we could talk speed, but I, it's, it's as fast a bow as I've shot in a long time. Uh, so, you know, 300 feet per second, I think is a nice, nice speed where I can still tune it. I could, I could probably tune fixed blade heads with it without too many issues, you know, but it's phenomenal with a mechanical. Um, I mean, those are kind of it for me. Speed and, and axle to axle. Speed and axle to axle. That'd be your yeah. dream. And, and quiet. You know, I like a quiet bow, obviously. It saved my ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then just balance and shoots and holds well. I I mean, it, accuracy I love. I mean, that's like, it's, I've said it before, but it really is like one of my most simple pleasures. And in, in, I'm, I'm talking in life. Like, one of the things I love more than anything is shooting a bow and arrow and just having the pen set, shot break, watching the arrow the entire way, and watching that arrow just like thud hit that X. It's mm-hmm. like the most satisfying feeling, and yeah. I can't explain it. And probably it's not the same for everybody, but for me, that's about as good as it gets. It's just so enjoyable. Simple things in life. That's yeah. it, man. Yeah, clear your head. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. What else you got? Are you so... I'm going to say this, but I'm also going to say you definitely don't need to do this probably at all. No reason to. I do it with rifles. So I was going to ask you, when you get a brand new bow, Mm -hmm. do you take everything apart and put it back together? Because when I get a brand new rifle, I take everything apart, put it back together. Like bolt? Everything. Barrel? Everything. Well, I mean, I don't take the barrel off my gun. (laughs) You know, I've... I've, You bet it? Yeah, the stock, but I... I take take it apart, clean up oils where there probably shouldn't be oils from from no factory. It's sitting around, Mm -hmm. and putting it back together, looking at all. Like, do you pull the limbs off? Do you you do any of that? Good old old Brady James. I've never had (laughs) never had the limbs off of it. No, No. never pulled limbs out of the limb pocket on this one. Uh, Yeah, I would say on a needed needed basis. So, like, if I was having tuning issues, you know, if I was getting some funky left or rights or something like that, and I felt like maybe I would wanted to swap limbs diagonally or something like that, then maybe I would. But no, I would say the first thing I do is just check my cam timing and then start with my knock point and then just start tuning process from there. But no, I don't ever take it apart. I, I'm, just, I'm just like curious, like how'd they build this? I take it all apart. Look, <laughs> at, look had, at all the machining, yeah. look at everything, like check it all out. I've had bows apart. Mm-hmm. Um I would say typically on a lot of the bows that I've had, the first thing I did was change the strings out. Uh, this is a new string from them. They're calling match grade or match strings from Matthews. And I would say it's a big step in the right direction. Uh, you know, they're older strings, the zebra strings, good materials, but I don't know what was going on in the actual manufacturing of those strings. But And the string was relatively stable once I shot it in, but it felt like I always had serving separation, especially where the draw stop rolled over into the cable. This bow's got way more, it's got more than a thousand shots guaranteed through it. I don't have any separation through my servings at all. Mm. Um, my peak comes back straight. Uh, I haven't noticed any stretch or creep or anything like that. No difference in, you know, cams moving or anything like that. So I would just from like, you know, two, three months of shooting a lot of arrows through it, I would say it's a big step in the right direction for strings. Hmm. So do you want to know one other psycho thing? You guys are going to make fun of me when I talk about all this shit. We always, we always we do. Make, we make but fun keep of you going. <laughs> so, so when I had, you know, shooting bows back in the day, like I was a psycho bow hunter, shot targets, shot yeah. tournaments, everything. I used to take, like I was talking about tearing apart a bow, like I used to tear apart my bow completely. Mm-hmm. Take it all down, take all the limbs off. And then I would swap all the hardware <clears> to titanium. <throat> just higher, I just wanted higher grade screws, higher grade like washers. Your limb bolts? Limb bolts, swap them all. Swap <laughs> everything to titanium. Every, <laughs> everything I could, swap it over to titanium, higher grade. I just, <laughs> I just, I don't, I can't really explain the reasoning Never besides did. for like, I just thought Look in good, my head. Look good, play like, good. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'll be shooting better. I'll tell you everything. what, maybe I, I've still got the phase four. Maybe I'll pull it all apart and swap it without with titanium everything just to see. It's like, is that, it not because difference. like, a, like, obviously not gonna be a lot of weight savings, but I was like, well, it's going to be higher grade materials. It's going to be mm-hmm. some, maybe try to, you know, Loctite things where I need a Loctite thing. Make sure things don't move. Just double, double, triple check everything. Nope. I'm not, <laughs> not, not, not down that nope. hole. Not maybe it's because I don't have kids. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of time. Yeah. I, I've never done that. Uh, 
Just as needed, I guess I would say. Yeah. But never, That's why I said you definitely don't need to do any of this by any means. I've had some bows over the years that I had to swap limbs, you know, diagonally or do something with it mm-hmm. to get it to tune. And I've, I've monkeyed around with that. But if I don't have to, I don't, I don't want to do that. That's how I feel. If I don't have to, I don't want to. Uh-huh. I also had my brother back in the day uh, weld me up a custom overdraw bracket. So. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, I need this for my bows because I yeah. want to cut arrows down a little bit shorter. So I had them, I like, I gave them precision specs. I like drew out this little drawing. I'm like, Bryce, can you make this for me? And back in Minnesota, he's like, yeah, that'll be, take me like 30 minutes. So I gave him this little spec sheet, gave him some like little rough things I cut out, like in cardboard, like make this exactly like this to these exact specs, put these holes in here, thread them at these thread pitch and gave it back to me. And it was phenomenal. Like just make like cool, cool custom accessories for it. Old, I, I yeah. shot my moose, my mountain goat with my bow back Every, in the day. Everybody all that was all done. Shoot an overdraw. Yeah, no one does anymore. But yeah, Tim, Tim still does. Oh my <laughs> man, <laughs> old Gillingham, love there's, that guy. There's a lot of people, yeah, that used to though. Yeah, um, I just, like, that's why I love. You know, I'm talking about now, I love shooting bows. I love that tinkering yeah. aspect. There's so much fun things you can do. It's like a lot of it's probably not necessary. Can I can I shoot well enough to See justify any of that? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. But my head. I'm getting a little bit better, and I'm learning more about how the bell works, how the tune works. I spend most of my time tinkering, I would say, in aim. Like, in aim? how well does the bow aim? Do you put lasers on anything in practicing I've, with lasers, I've, like I've a laser pointer? D- I've not done that. I just mostly track it by score. You know, yeah. like, how well does the bow seem to aim? Does it feel super solid? And, you know, is the arrow hitting X when it feels like it breaks when it's, you know, the pins on it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I spend a lot of my time with like draw length and D loop length and tune. I would say are like the, th- the three things I end up tinkering with the most. Do you write down notes? Of everything I do. You're doing for the bow. Do you I have like a notebook? This is Matthew's lift. This is how I tinkered it. This is I a lot twist. Yep, sitting there on my bow press. And then if I'm at the archery range and I make any kind of changes, I'll just make it in a field notebook. And then I always try to keep track of that because I'm getting older and I forget shit. So <laughs> if something just starts, the wheels start to fall off, I want to go back and like, look like, what did I do exactly? So mm-hmm. yeah, I do have a notebook and kind of track it, but it's fun. That's what's fun about it. I know Lorenzo's having. Oh, I'm yeah. It's I'm having a blast. Yeah. I just wish it was easier to shoot ranges here. That's the only, that yeah. my, it's like driving me nuts that it's so hard to shoot a range here. You got to get a range at home. At the Gohan office. At the Gohan office. Come on. So, yeah, that's all I'll say to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, run, right. Quickly, Renzo, what do you think we're, like, so obviously you built your own home bow setup. Bow okay. shop. Yeah. What, what were the, like, the couple pieces of gear that you thought were the most essential for doing what you're doing? Like, basically, you're, you're like, super tuning everything. So what do you think your top three? Or? I mean, the press and the draw board, for sure. Because you I mean, do so much with both of yeah, those. Yeah, so things. much, so much with both of those. Like ninety percent of everything with with those two, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the digital caliper has like been huge for me. Yeah. Um, just to like micro tune stuff and see where I'm at and what I'm doing. Um, and then what's a third? What's the next most essential? Anything on arrow building? Oh it, well, yeah. I saw mean, I was a little bit of a rabbit hole. I mean, arrow well, building. saw saw and squaring tool, all that stuff, which. Is that one on Is that is that mm-hmm. not one on one? Is that one? Yeah. So like that squaring and all that, so I can start messing with these arrows. And then I broke down and bought full price, bought the Fletchmaster Pro from Last Chance. Mm-hmm. Um, the Bits and Burgers good. It's great, but there's like just a little bit of for me because I am not I'm not like overly detail driven like you are. I'm a little more lackadaisical about things, and I like to do things out of enjoyment than torture myself with like absolute precise and there's just a little too much that i could mess up with that bits and burger jig and all the arrows i've done so much is is with that but i i broke down and got the the Fletchmaster pro love i know a new one i'm love gonna it. buy have you guys seen this uh hamsky's making this little arrow level i'm trying to think of the name of it but the cool thing about it is you can put it on your arrow and it's got uh a measurement so it'll give you like it's one of the measurements i've always been like it's kind of hard to measure is your distance from riser so center oh, yeah. of arrow distance of the riser yeah 13 sixteenths so you're like kind of eyeballing That's, it right i do that with the digital caliper sure which has been great yeah been great this one's you can set it at 13 sixteenths exactly yeah on your arrow yeah on your rest and you can measure that it'll mm-hmm. also help you level your arrow as you're setting up your Ooh. your uh air level and Send tying in your one. knock points i'll buy it yeah we have them in the shop oh we do yeah well i'm buying them I'm, for sure I'm, so out of our archery. Here houses. we go. 
Since I, since I retired from merch, I can't remember if this is still a thing. Maybe even selling the gear shop. I don't know. But do you, do you have the – so when I had my Bits and Burger, I had three of them set up for every single arrow. And uh, so I didn't have to change anything. Everything was adjusted perfectly. But then I had the Zenith archery mm-hmm. upgrades for all of them. Do for they still sure. make those? Yep. We, we sell those. Oh, good deal. <laughs> yeah. So you don't even – I haven't even looked. Yeah. But I thought those were a big upgrade on the Bits and Burger. So you have a Bits and Burger, look at the Zenith archery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Wait, it goes where's that arrow? little tip been? It, 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 it's a knock where's that one been, Brady? Well, You've given me I, I, so many I, I other ones. I have to give you them slowly. <laughs> yeah, slowly. arrow receiver essentially makes sure that there's no play in your arrow rather than losing your using your knock. Yeah, yeah this is the Hamsky Archery Waypoint Arrow Level. Huh. So you can set that on. Oh, so what's cool about this is you can screw this thing against the riser and adjust your height of your arrow and then also the distance of your arrow from the shelf and with the level. That's awesome. Uh, it's pretty sick. 71 bucks. Let's go grab one after this. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to see that for works. sure. Yeah, one of those. I'm going to buy one of those before I go home today. Perfect. You both are buying them, I sound like. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, anyway, pretty cool. And what's these Zenith things you're talking about? What is this? Oh, it's, it's uh, basically for the knock, for the knock mm-hmm. on the back, and then it also has an adjustment on the front of the Bits and Burger, so you can like lift it up and play the left or right, so it actually centers it perfectly. The knock it's one a Bits and Burger upgrade kit. Do you so sell the front one? The one that actually you drill a holes yeah. on the front as well? Yep. So this one essentially just goes in the back of your Bits and Burger jig, and then you can slide the arrow on the back end of it so there's no play in it. So you're not using the knock. You're actually mm, sliding that like, like a it. sleeve it's in the back yeah. of Because that knock has play. That's, it that's, rotates side to side And that's what bit. I'm talking about with, like, there's just a little too much room for error for somebody like myself on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I just went. With your the, knock, there is. Yeah, this one, there yeah. isn't so much, which yeah. is, yeah. Well, I, I would, just went. Fletch Master Pro. Yeah. I always tell people if you're buying a Bits and Burger, you should definitely buy a Zenith uh, archery upgrade kit for it. Yeah. just makes it that much more secure. Um, yeah, pliers and what else? Uh, you definitely have to have some pliers. Um, yeah, definitely needle nose. Needle nose pliers. pliers and then just your, your Allen wrench sets. Uh, cool thing is, is that like Last Chance Archery sells all these kits. Like yeah. they sell... <laughs> All this stuff that you probably don't think you need, but you can buy the whole kit. I think it's like a hundred bucks. And you'll get like the I mean, all the stuff that you probably don't think you need, but yeah. you'll it'll come in handy. And it's like right now, I think, I mean, a easy press green, last chance, I think it's like three ninety nine, three seventy nine, something like that. So you can get a press, a saw, a jig, you know, basic tools. Um, you know, I think a draw, one of these guys. Draw scale. draw scale is handy to have. It's going to give your holding weight and your max weight. That's handy for setting your bow back to spec. What brand's that one? Uh, last chance. Yeah. I saw that old least in one. But I would say you could probably get all set up for your own archery shop for what, 800, 900 bucks, a yeah. thousand bucks? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so for it's, sure. It's not that crazy of an investment. And I've been using the same press for a long time. And same saw for ages. Mine's free. I've just been using Brady's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, I found a couple of tool trays last night that I have. You know that because I have that big. Yeah. It's basically that Ryobi miter saw stand yeah. that yeah. the press goes on. I actually have some tool trays that are supposed to go on the Ooh, back. They're fantastic. flats. They're, they're little, little like cookie cooking. Go ahead and bring things. those in for me. Yeah. So they, they, <laughs> they attach right there, so you can put more of your tools and your D loop and all that stuff on there. Hell and yeah. I have that one on the back of the yeah the press, but this one opens up to bigger stuff. More trays. Yeah. yeah. So I got to bring those other trays in for you. Hell yes. Yep. Love it. Yeah, I would say if you have any interest in it at all, I've had people ask me like, oh, when do you think I should invest in my own archery equipment? I'm like, well, how long do you think you're going to be bow hunting? And if the answer is like, I don't ever see me stopping, like you should invest. Sooner and rather than later. Sooner than later. My learn, learn I wish I did this a long time and Look ago. how much gas money you're saving. So that was the biggest reason why I started becoming my own, mm-hmm. you know, building all my own bows because I have to drive. I had to drive to a pro shop, which when I lived in Montana, that was a long ways away. Yeah. So think of that investment, that time. You can learn everything and be more proficient with it. If you just start buying things slowly, make maybe every year you add a new piece to it. Mm-hmm. There's some great pro shops. I mean, nothing against pro shops. I think you should still, you know, utilize your pro shops. But if you have the means, the interest, and the ability to get your own equipment and a space to do it, yeah, I don't think there's anything more satisfying. Agreed. Cool. It's very satisfying. <laughs> Anything else? Any other thoughts about the new bows? Any questions we missed? Uh, I guess if I was to wrap it up in a bow, my new review, my review of the lift, uh, I've had tons of DMs. Is it worth it? In my opinion, yes. I think it's the best advancement they've had in ages. It's faster. It's, quieter. It's as quiet or quieter. Uh, it's lighter. It holds better. It aims better. Uh, 
I mean, what else? Yeah. <laughs> what else mm-hmm. do you need? <laughs> right. In my opinion, it's the best bow they've had in ages. It's the most excited I've been about a hunting bow in a long mm-hmm. time. If Trail says that, it was enough for me to switch from the Halon. Yeah. There. I, I take that. There you go. That's what, when Trail told me that, I'm like, yep, that's enough. Okay. Yeah. There's your take home. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, appreciate it. Good podcast. I love all those tech little details. Yeah, I always have to end these when I have to pee, and we're we're out of time. We're there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, yeah. See ya.